but they are often carrying important social and cultural significance. Recipes and dietary practices can be used to transmit knowledge from one generation to another. Making and eating certain foods as a part of celebration can solidify social bonds. If we look into India, Indian food has gone from simple times through rough times and today with globalization, Indian food is still struggling to find its niche in the world. The reason for this is very simple. To an uninitiated, Indian food is just like a normal curry eaten with rice and bread. Indian food has an impression of being spicy and hot outside of India. But we Indians know that this is far from true. Today, we try to break this understanding of the Indian food through this uh, webinar on culinary practices in India, prehistoric to modern. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to all the guests of this, uh, all the speakers of this event, Mr. Krish Ashok, who is the global head of digital workplace, uh, TCS, and the author of Masala Lab, The Science of Indian Cooking. Our second speaker is Professor Dorian Fuller, UCL, uh, from the UCL Institute of Archaeology, University College London, UK. And our third speaker is Professor Ganesh Bagler from the Department of Computational Biology, IIIT Delhi, New Delhi. And to inaugurate this uh, event, it is my immense pleasure, I invite Professor Prabhat Ranjan, our Honorable Vice Chancellor and the, uh, of D.Y. Patil International University, Akurdi Pune. Thank you, Dr. Surubi, and good morning to all of you. It is my pleasure to welcome all the experts who have taken time out from their busy to join us. The University of Dewey Patil International University in Akurdi campus of Pune is relatively new. We are only four years uh, old or it's, uh, four years young. Uh, but personally, I'm a scientist, although not from this field, from nuclear fusion side. But our focus is to make sure that we can bring the research from across the globe into our university and to others. Uh, we have been working on chronic health problems. Personally, I also am involved with this. And we know that the food we eat, the way we eat, influences our health as well. And it is important to understand how we have evolved throughout this period. As Dr. Suryu was mentioning, when I was a child, with a tough time when there was famine in the eastern part of India, we were exposed to food coming from US, especially wheat and milk powder. Our, I have seen in my lifetime itself, uh, the food that we are eating, uh, some of them used to be dark, all that dark has been replaced by white food. And so it has probably affected health of all of us, but I'm not going to spend more time on this. I will let the experts speak about all of this and we welcome again to this event. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Honorable Vishi sir, for your uh, time making for us for this webinar too, and for your encouraging words as ever. Thank you again, sir. So, without delay, uh, we should start with the first session. We have uh, first session by uh, Krish Ashok. Let me take the opportunity to uh, introduce him with a shortage of words because it is again almost impossible to describe his experiences, achievements, and awards uh, in few minutes. So, uh, Chris Asok is not a chef but cooks daily. He is not a scientist but he can explain science with easy to understand clarity. He trained to be an electronic engineer but he is now an, a software engineer. He learned to cook from a woman in his family who can make that perfectly pulpy idli without lecturing, without people on lactobacilli and pH levels. He likes the scientific method not because it offers him the ability to bully people with knowledge, but it confidently lets him say, I don't know, uh, let me taste it for myself. When he's not cooking, he is usually playing subversive music on the violin or cello. He lives in Chennai with a wife. He secondly prevents him from buying more gadgets for kitchen and a son who has the flora and fauna uh, in the neighborhood terrorized. Uh, 
Krista Sok is the author of Masala Lab, the Indian, the science of Indian cooking. Today he will be discussing about modern Indian cooking, pseudo science, and food science. So let's welcome him with a uh, big clap. Yeah. So sir, uh, stage is yours, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, uh, introducing me uh, uh, and sort of hyping the whole thing up. But uh, uh, I hear a bit of an echo. So, and uh, I'm wondering if uh, the classroom needs to be muted while I'm presenting, maybe. All right. So, I'm just going to share my screen. Just a second. Just give me one second. I might need to leave this and join back because it's not letting me share my screen. So I have to give it some permissions and get back. So just give me about 10 seconds. Huh? Y. Patel International University, Akurdi, Pune, carrying legacy of 36 years of education excellence. Following the footsteps of Padma Shri, Dr. D. Y. Patel, under the graceful guidance of Founder Vice Chancellor, Prof. Prabhat Ranjan, a nuclear fusion scientist, a futurist. Carve the path to your future career with D.Y. Patel International University, Akurdi, Pune. A new era postgraduate and undergraduate courses, trend setting, multi track specializations, forward looking pedagogy, modern infrastructure, well qualified faculty, state of the art laboratories, and many more. For more details, please visit our website dypiu.ac.in or call us on plus nine one nine zero seven one one two three four three four sorry uh, I hope I'm audible now all right apologies uh, some issues with the Mac so I had to uh, switch off the browser to come back to share my screen just give me a second all right uh, just let me know once you're seeing my screen and I'll get started All right. Uh, so uh, my name is uh, Ashok, and in the in the South Indian naming format, uh, my name comes at the end, and my uh, my father's name comes at the front, and so it's it's a different naming format. And even within India, there's this incredible diversity, not just across food, but even in how we name ourselves. Uh, so although my talk is actually going to be about modern Indian cooking, and uh, the uh, the reason I wrote this book is because uh, uh, it's quite surprising that nobody has written about the science of uh, Indian cooking. Um, uh, uh, there is there is just a lot of documentation about the science of things like baking, the science of um, how to make pasta, how to make the perfect pizza, and so on. And there's obviously there is food science in the context of uh, the commercial food production industry. Uh, companies that make snacks, uh, you know, biscuits and, and cheese and so on, um, or dairy products for that matter, because you do need food science to be able to reliably and consistently uh, make food that tastes the same way. Uh, but what's interesting is that 
nobody had apparently thought it was useful to write about the context of day to day high school science uh, that you observe every day when you actually cook in the kitchen and it's also quite interesting and and unsurprising that uh, pseudoscience abounds uh, at the intersection of particularly nutrition health um, and and indian cooking right that constant tension between modernity uh, and and the sense that somehow our ancestors knew better um, and that there was ayurveda and and people were healthier in the past and and those kinds of things um, and so to address all of this i know there are other fantastic speakers who are going to be speaking about the past about the history and about uh, a lot of other interesting things i'm actually going to start sort of 2.7 billion years ago and then bear in mind this is just going to be a 5 minute segue to get into what i'm going to speak about right um this is in a sense to get everyone who's thinking about food uh even people who are not necessarily interested in cooking uh, etc every time you eat something uh you have to be you have to be filled with wonder at the sense that uh, all of this began 2.7 billion years ago uh when the only form of life on the planet that uh were were these single celled organisms called prokaryotes right? these were very very basic cells um uh, uh, etc right so this is this is pre uh, modernity in the sense of any kind of modern cell all of us are actually you have eukaryotic cells anyway so 2.7 billion years ago one of these cells um, as life tends to do food is essentially one form of life killing and eating another form of life uh, that's essentially what the definition of food is but at one point of time one of these prokaryotes sort of consensually kidnapped uh, another cell uh, which ended up becoming the mitochondria and and this essentially gave the cell a fantastic new set of capabilities because for starters this other cell this mitochondria was just simply able to focus on uh, energy right all it does is convert between uh, atp adp you know deals with glucose and so on so the cell was able to specialize and start doing many other things right it sort of started the uh, revolution where more complex organisms could be created right uh, bear with me i know we're talking about food but i'll tell you what the connection is right um, and this so this this bit of consensual kidnapping essentially created the first eukaryotes all of us today uh, are are descendants of that first eukaryotic cell uh, that that essentially was created as a result of this endosymbiotic union if you will right um, and then about 450 million to 2 billion years ago we're not exactly sure when uh, another interesting thing happened another cell uh, that figured out how to do photosynthesis meaning the ability to convert the energy of some frequencies of sunlight uh to turn carbon dioxide and water into glucose um, is the is one of the single most important things to happen on planet earth right that's a sort of foundation of pretty much else because plants are pretty much at the bottom of the food chain if you will right uh, so photosynthesis is how uh, how did we get photosynthesis one of these eukaryotic cells did this bit of kidnapping again so it kidnapped yet another bacteria uh, that was able to do photosynthesis and then turned it into the chloroplast which is what you find uh, in every plant right uh, and you know fun fact why are plants green because it's the one frequency of light that they have no use for right so they extract their uh, energy from other frequencies of light not green and they reflect it back and that's why plants are green uh, so it's funny right so we associate plants with the color green and yet it's the one color of light that they do not want and so what do we get from plants we get carbohydrates uh because plants need uh, uh to build material that is strong enough um, and able to store energy reserves for long enough you know in their seeds um, and within their tree trunks and so on and that's the origin of how we essentially got carbohydrates right um so literally most of the things that we eat today about 50 50 60% of our calories although you might argue that indians tend to eat a lot more than 50% in their diet is comes from carbohydrates uh, every grain uh, every every legume every pulse a very common misconception people think legumes and pulses and dals are mostly protein they are not they're mostly carbohydrates uh, in fact 100 grams of cooked dal has about 2 to 4 grams of carbohydrates so you want you want vegetarian protein you know you have to go you know eat paneer so that's 13 14 grams of uh, protein anyway so on that note what is the other interesting thing is that so that gave us carbohydrates okay uh um, the other interesting thing that happened is that remember photosynthesis photosynthesis actually ended up being very inefficient uh once the oxygen levels in the atmosphere began to grow up so the first generation of plants that produced a ton of oxygen as part of photosynthesis shot themselves in the foot because 
photosynthesis ended up being really, really inefficient. One particular step in photosynthesis turned out to be very inefficient in a high oxygen environment, which, which by the way, made life like us possible. You know, in a lower oxygen environment, life like us would not have been possible, right? And so plants ended up shooting themselves in the foot. And one of the things that happened is that plants, in case you notice, uh, you know, trees don't have tentacles that can grab you and eat you, right? Like animals can. Uh, so plants are largely stationary. Uh, because their metabolic rate, their ability to use up energy fast enough is very slow because photosynthesis is exceedingly slow. So that's why trees live thousands of years. Right? So everything in a plant happens in slow motion. Um, and the only way they can defend themselves is they can't fight, they don't have teeth, etc. But what they have is they produce chemical weapons. right? So every different family of plants produce different molecules uh, that are essentially about chemical warfare. It's about killing bacteria, about killing fungi, uh, about preventing animals from eating them, uh, producing poisons uh, and so on, right? Uh, and what you find is that at the root of something that's very central to Indian cooking, spices uh, are essentially chemical warfare by plants against insects, against animals and so on, right? So an onion, essentially, when you cut the cell of an onion, an enzymatic reaction creates a molecule that essentially makes you cry by breaking down in your eyes as dilute sulfuric acid. So an onion literally does an acid attack on you. Okay. Uh, but we still eat onions by cooking it uh, so that we denature all of those uh, dangerous uh, sort of uh, molecules and so on. We do that with garlic. We do that with uh, chilies, for instance. We do that with every one of these spices. All of them have spice flavor molecules that we consider to be flavor. But essentially, the rest of the insect, uh, fungi, and bacterial world considers to be anti-insecticidal, antibacterial and uh, a fungicidal and so on, right? So essentially, plants' chemical warfare is at the root of food flavor uh, uh, in India. So that's number one. Uh, so kind of going to about 65 million years ago, something even more interesting happened. Uh, in what is today the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, there's this sort of giant meteorite that, uh, that crashed into the earth, right? Uh, one of the most cataclysmic, apocalyptic events, if you will. Uh, because what it did is that it, it is said to have destroyed close to 80 to 90% of all life on the planet, right? Uh, and very few things survived. So for starters, it killed off all the dinosaurs. It's very important because if the dinosaurs did not die out, uh, mammals would not have had the opportunity and the space to colonize the planet. Um, and ultimately then, you know, one family of those mammals, the primates, then evolved into, you know, homo sapiens and so on. So we, we, we would have not have been possible if not for this... Uh, if not for this asteroid uh, sort of uh, meteorite attack uh, on the planet, right? Now, this, uh, so this, this is the uh, sort of artist's sort of estimation of what that crater might have looked like and so on. Uh, and what is interesting is that uh, when, when such a thing happens, you have a nuclear winter for centuries, right? Meaning that there's so much dust in the atmosphere uh, that essentially you, you, you don't, sunlight, enough sunlight does not get through, so the temperature falls. So and one of the interesting things that happened, obviously, is that most of the dinosaurs, if they did not, most of the larger reptiles like the dinosaurs died out directly in the impact of that. But many of even the smaller reptiles ended up dying out because they were cold blooded. right? And so in colder temperatures, they cannot regulate their body temperature enough to keep out things like yeast infections. So a lot of reptiles essentially died from fungal and yeast infections, right? Mammals, on the other hand, are warm-blooded, right? 37 Celsius is pretty warm. Um, and it essentially keeps most fungal infections out. So uh, that's why if you think about where you get fungal infections, it's in the parts of your body that are actually cold and so on, right? Now, what's interesting is that now we know that dinosaurs probably look like this, meaning that some of them had feathers. I'll, let me tell you where I'm going with this. So one of the things uh, that survived the uh, that that asteroid attack are flying reptiles that eventually evolved into modern day birds. Uh, and about nine or ten thousand years ago, it is estimated that somewhere in Bengal uh, that uh, and again this might have happened in many parts of the world, but definitely the jungle fowl was domesticated at some point of time. Uh, uh, definitely, possibly in India, possibly in China as well, independently, but definitely in India for sure. Uh, and that's how we get our modern day chicken. Right? And so we obviously handpick characteristics like, you know, not being able to fly very well so it can't run off uh, and so on uh, and, and docility and things like that. And basically we have the modern day chicken. So wh wh what do we get? So essentially what you're, when you're eating a chicken, you're literally eating one of the descendants of uh, dinosaurs, of flying dinosaurs, if you will. Right? So again, so what do we get from uh, 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 animals is that we get protein. 
right? Uh, we get, uh, so essentially muscle tissue connected to uh, using connective tissue into bones and we eat the connective tissue and, and at the beat, the connective tissue is harder to cook. Uh, the muscle tissue cooks very quickly. Uh, and again, it's quite interesting. People think that vegetables are harder to cook. No, meat actually requires a lower temperature. Uh, starch requires a higher temperature to cook. Uh, meat requires a lower temperature to cook. Um, in fact, that, which is why you can have a steak uh, cooked at about 50, uh, 52 Celsius. Uh, chicken tends to be cooked at a higher temperature because of salmonella. But in general, uh, uh, so this is where we get most of our protein from. I know some of you are going, yes, of course, we can get protein from plants too. Yes, but not all essential amino acids unless you mix the right set of foods. So that's why historically, cultures like India, uh, where there is a relatively strong uh, vegetarian culture, and I say relatively strong because it's a mis common misconception that most Indians are vegetarian. Uh, for example, in the south and east of India, 98% of people are meat-eating. Only 2% are vegetarian. The large bulk of vegetarians live in the north and west of India, uh, where about 30-40% of the population, again, not a majority, uh, uh, tend to be uh, vegetarian and so on. So you tend to mix things like rice and dal, uh, which kind of gives you a complete amount of all of the amino acids uh, that you need. right? Uh, and even then, if you in, in, in India, if you notice, people eat dairy, uh, which incidentally is animal protein. So as long as you're eating dairy, you're largely okay. And so, so coming to, so when you really think about why, why did I give this sort of background? It's essentially that if you take something like a chicken curry okay, uh, and eat it with rice, this is the story of the rice. Right, it goes back to 2.7 billion years ago, uh, to to the to the first you know prokaryotic cell becoming a eukaryotic cell, uh, and then ultimately later figuring out how to do photosynthesis, and then plants figuring out uh, uh, how to grow, and then grass is evolving, uh, and then humans domesticating some of those grass breeds uh, for height and for more seeds and so on. So you have modern rice and wheat and millets and corn, uh, and thus obviously you also then have uh, uh, you know meat. Uh, that we've been eating uh, since time memorial, and that's where we get most of our protein from, yeah, and so on, right? So when you really come down to uh, the sense of how we think about the Indian kitchen, um, it's that you often find that uh, there's a stunning variety of cooking materials that we use, right? Uh, and again, if you think about the basic science, uh, so stainless steel is something that's relatively very, very new, right? And stainless steel is not a great conductor of heat, by the way. Uh, and it's also a very uneven conductor of heat. So when you have a stainless steel vessel, you're going to have some hot spots and some really cool spots, right? So you're, you're likely to have sort of this uneven heating, right? Uh, cast iron, again, is a fantastic uh, uh, retainer of heat. And again, something, it's a material that we've been using for a while. Great advantage of cast iron uh, is the fact that if you cook it with enough oil, uh, there's a polymer layer forms on the oil, uh, making it non-stick effectively. Right. So that's how essentially uh, these materials. So uh, we've also historically been using things like copper vessels uh, as well, and a little bit more uh, recently aluminium vessels. If you cook acidic foods and in copper and aluminium vessels, like essentially tomatoes and tamarind uh, and things that are acids, right? Uh, they tend to leach the metal into the food, um, and copper and aluminium at high concentrations not so good for you. Iron is okay, right? Uh, you can deal with it. It might your food might taste metallic, but it's not bad for you. But copper and aluminium, acidic uh, conditions, not so great, uh, and so on, right? Um, and kind of think about uh, how uh, heat itself is transferred, you know, when you bake, when you bake, uh, when you cook with Indian food, right? Uh, so when you cook on a pan, heat is transferred by conduction. Uh, and when you cook in water or in oil, when you deep fry a puri uh, or when you heat something in an, a tandoor, the heat is being transferred either by air in case of a tandoor or by water in case you're boiling or by water vapor in case you're steaming uh, like in Italy and so on, right? Uh, and so clearly, I think uh, conduction, you know, when you place a chapati on top of the uh, the vessel, uh, it's obvious that the material underneath is not going to transfer heat evenly because it's not perfectly flat. So as you can see from that chapati there, it's going to have these darker spots because that's where more heat ended up getting applied. Right? Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you cook in water or in oil, a puri does not have those spots because an oil ensures that heat is transferred uh, all over. <coughs> Why do we use water versus oil is also quite interesting. Right? Uh, fats actually do not react with your food at all. They go straight in. Uh, in fact, and since your body is mostly water, uh, and we know fats don't mix with water, uh, what your body actually does is that it uses an emulsifying agent. So it sort of turns all the fat you eat into something that looks like mayonnaise. 
till it's actually broken down in your intestines right so imagine that so all the oils you eat they become mayonnaise as, as they kind of go down okay? uh and what's interesting is that uh the difference between cooking in water and cooking in oil is the fact that water you can only cook under 100 celsius because water boils at 100 celsius at sea level right if you go to the hills it boils at an even lower temperature which makes cooking difficult by the way which is why in the hills people tend to use pressure cookers because in a pressure cooker the boiling point of water is much higher right now what happens in a uh, uh, with fats is that the fats will start to sort of smoke only at temperatures close to 200 celsius meaning that you can actually cook food at very high temperatures now the amazing thing is that all the really flavorful things in food happen when you see this color this beautiful browning that you see on food is where all flavor comes from right that's called the maillard reaction so in general you know uh, why do people insist on sauteing deep frying before they add things to a gravy particularly in any indian, indian restaurant is because they want to get the maillard reaction going and you can't get the maillard reaction going inside a gravy right so this is one and the other interesting thing is that if there is one specific way of describing what south asian cooking is about uh let me say for example if you describe japanese cooking as being about umami heavy broths right a lot of dishes uh, tend to be about getting glutamates from things like seaweed uh, and and tuna flakes and so on into into a broth right uh, then so that way your the rest of your ingredients can be very minimalist because umami tends to amplify everything else. so that's it's one way of describing sort of japanese cooking south asian cooking and it extends to southeast asia as well is really fats plus spices meaning that the start of every cooking any kind of dish starts with heating oil uh, that is unique to that region and a combination of spices that are unique to that region right so here's the interesting thing uh if you take mustard oil and add mustard seeds nigella uh you know celery seeds uh carom seeds uh, as well as fenugreek no matter what you do after that what ingredients you add it does not matter it will taste bengali people will instantly recognize it as bengali food uh, if you take coconut oil and add curry leaves and ginger and garlic and cumin no matter what you do after that will taste like kerala food right if you if you use sesame oil and you use uh, garlic and red chilies and fennel then no matter what you do it will taste like chettinad food right likewise ghee and cumin and asafoetida will taste of say punjabi food for like for example right uh, so what you have to remember uh, is that uh, the combination of fats and spices pretty much determine the flavor profile of every region right uh, all the other things are actually matter a lot less uh especially when it comes to the fundamental side dishes and gravies flavors essentially come from fats and spices and that's pretty much central to the identity of every regional form of indian cooking right now another common misconception is this idea that uh ingredients actually absorb flavors uh no actually that's just not how life works right so if you take your hand and apply ginger garlic paste uh, i can assure you the ginger garlic flavor is not going inside your skin uh because our cells have a vested interest in keeping things uh, that they don't like out Uh, so the only thing that can actually get inside is water and salt and salt by osmosis right so we'll anyway talk about it so in general when you say that you cook it for longer so that the spices actually get inside anything else they don't they actually just simply get dissolved into the gravy and into the fats right so they're not actually entering any of your ingredients so this is an important sort of uh, misconception right um the other element about cooking is is fundamentally about breaking larger molecules into smaller molecules right so cooking is the outsourcing of digestion uh humans are humans because we invented cooking uh because uh, a cow spends about 70% of all of the energy of things it eats simply on digesting the things it eats we on the other hand spend a significantly smaller percentage because we cook our food uh, we already break it down into smaller molecules uh so our digestion ha- has to do a lot less work uh and in a sense what that does is that it it has allowed uh, primates and it has allowed us particularly to spend a lot more of that energy building and sustaining a giant brain uh, which takes up a bulk of the energy needs given its size right uh so therefore cooking is something that uniquely makes us human you know, in in that sense right so we spoke about browning reactions uh you also spoke about the fact that vegetables and meat actually cook very differently and remember that story that i told you about how plants evolved and how animals evolved um that story should actually give you the visual intuition for why vegetables are the way they are and meat is the way it is right 
plants don't move uh, and so plant material is stiff and hard right the idea of a fresh vegetable is that it's crunchy and hard right uh, on the other hand um, animals tend to move right and so that's why they need flexible uh, structures and so that's why meat is generally soft and elastic and flexible now the interesting thing is that when you cook vegetables they become soft and when you cook meat it becomes hard right and again it goes back to the fact that meat is made of protein fibers and as, as, as soon as you heat it uh, those 3d structures break down and the protein denatures it loses water so the water comes out uh, and it becomes harder and drier right something all of you would have seen when you're cooking uh, uh, with chicken breast is that it gets so dry right uh, so the interesting thing is that if you uh, soak it in salt uh, the salt will actually prevent moisture loss in meat so which is why when you go for an exercise and then you run and you're tired you drink water with salt um, and sugar the sugar for the energy and salt to prevent you from losing further water from your muscles right so that you don't get dehydrated right so that's again so many of these common day to day observations in your kitchen are connected to the simple high school science and biology that we all study it's not some you know fancy thing and so on uh, other interesting things so new uh, as a general uh, culture you know in india we've resisted the idea of introduction of you know newer devices right so e e even now you'll find a lot of misinformation that microwave is is dangerous radiation it will nu nuke your food uh, let me tell you this uh, nuking food uh, can happen only with x rays and gamma rays uh, that have a lot of energy microwave has less energy than even visible light uh, so, so if you put your food outside just outside right uh, there is more energy in the in in the in the frequency of the light that is hitting it visible light that is hitting it than what's hitting you uh, than what's hitting it in the microwave microwaves essentially heat water molecules because the amount of energy that specific frequency of microwave has is able to flip water molecules which are basically polar right which are positive and negative and so you keep changing the direction of the microwave the water will keep flipping it will heat up the water and that in turn you know, cooks the food uh, so that's basically what uh, microwaves are about now uh, part of the reason i often these might all seem like very foundational basics uh, they apply no matter which part of the world you're in and it's but it's still quite curious that somehow in india we consider cooking to be this art that only our grandmothers know and uh, that oh it's it's no science it's all art and so on that's really not true uh, your grandmother is fantastic at cooking because she's been doing it all her life and she's put in the 10000 hours or so uh, of getting to a level where what is essentially craft looks like art to you, right uh, so in essence i think it's it's is really important that we understand that a lot of craft and basic engineering and tacit scientific wisdom right your grandmother may not know intuitively about the maillard reaction but she knows that brown things are more delicious again you don't have to know food science to make you know delicious food right so that's the interesting thing okay? now the other interesting thing obviously is is now that you've cooked your food right you appreciated all of this history and appreciated the simple thermodynamics uh chemistry and biology of what you're eating then it then we get into this idea of how you perceive flavor uh that again is you know quite fascinating so this original idea that your tongue has these zones where you detect sweet and salt here and umami here and sour here that is wrong right so apparently uh it was it was a uh, so it came from a, a german scientist uh, in the 1950s and then since then it's sort of become uh, common knowledge but apparently it is it is not founded on any fact every part of your tongue can taste almost every taste right now so interesting thing is that the recognition that uh, flavor is essentially taste aroma and mouth feel right uh, taste is detected by taste buds aromas are detected by your nose uh, and mouth feel is detected by the trigeminal nervous system all the nerve endings in your mouth right? now so when you taste something salty that's a taste right uh, but when you bite into a cardamom and somebody asks you what is the taste of cardamom um the correct answer is bitter because all spices tend to be bitter but they have aromas uh, and aroma is 80% of how you perceive flavor right so your brain does a curious sort of gymnastic trick where it makes it feel like the like what you smell is what you actually taste right so because if you think a lot of the tasting is happening in your nose then you will choke so your brain does the sort of little bit of juggling to fool you into thinking that all of the action is happening in your mouth but in reality all of the action is actually happening in your nose so which is why when you have a cold or covid related anosmia you can't smell food and if you can't smell food you can only taste food right and taste is only sweet salty so if you look at every culture in the world what people eat when they are sick 
it tends to be either foods that are very high on umabi chicken soup right uh, you know fish broth and so on right so that's one uh, in india you will have like dal chawal uh, with a lot of salt with a lot of tamarind with a lot of amchur with a lot of lime uh, because sourness and sweetness and saltiness are things that you can detect even when you have a coat right so that's essentially how this works now so what is interesting is that uh, we kind of think that we only the tongue and the nose are the only things uh, that really form the sort of flavor detection apparatus that's not true uh, your stomach and your guts also taste and they also have uh, taste buds they also have nerve endings that are able to detect uh, foods in fact they have ways in which they count calories so here's an interesting uh, insight right part of the reason why uh, drinking uh, a coke or a pepsi or in general sort of carbonated sugary beverages is associated with obesity uh, for instance uh, is because uh, we did not evolve uh, to drink food that is liquid and had calories i think about it so most of our life was spent uh, our evolutionary life was spent being a cave you know you know sort of prehistoric paleolithic times hunter gatherers maximum you know you for most part you're eating hunting animals and eating and depending on which part of the world you're in you're like digging up roots or perhaps you know eating the occasional sort of berries and fruits when it's fruiting during the summer season and so on right uh, so when you think about that uh, we never other than breast milk uh, we do not drink any liquid food uh, that has calories um and and that is that is in a sense modern day uh food like for example any, any carbonated sugary beverages and again it goes back to the history of how sugar then became so cheap you know in the middle ages sugar was considered to be very expensive uh but at once you know you had slavery you had uh, sugar plantations uh, all over the americas and india and everywhere else uh, sugar became cheap uh, and then essentially now uh, sugar is just too easily available right and so your your gut cannot count calories very well uh when it's liquid calories and so it does not send the signal that oh you're full you've got enough calories you're feeling full now and so people drink entire like uh, uh sodas that are filled with calories it could be milkshakes could be any of these kinds of very calorie heavy things um and then what they realize is that they still feel hungry so they end up eating more right so again that's how uh this kind of things happens right um and the other interesting thing is that if cooking was not enough Uh, there is also a fantastic tradition around the world and it's not unique to india the idea of further using uh, some more interesting friendly bacteria and fungi to ferment your food to break it down even further uh, to make it more nutritious uh, like for example urad dal by itself is filled with anti nutrients uh, uh, that that the plant clearly does not want you to eat it right uh, but then we are able to soak it and we are able to ferment it and allow the bacteria to break down those complex starches into all of the smaller ones make a lot of the unlock a lot of those vitamins um and amino acids uh, so that your idli is actually much more flavorful than the original urad dal that kind of went in right uh, and so on so so in a sense but there is so if you come a little bit deeper into this our brains are also uh, slightly sort of crazy when it comes to thinking about food itself right uh so color for example is plays a very important role so i did this interesting bit of analytics i looked at uh, uh i ran a python script to find out all ingredients uh, in many of the food blogs uh, around india right uh, guess what was the most used ingredient unsurprisingly it's turmeric powder right uh, literally you know 90 95% of recipes uh, gravy recipes will have turmeric powder it Does, doesn't matter right because we like that color yellow we like that color red we associate it with certain things and yes uh we associate certain colors with certain flavors green is associated with bitter uh red and yellow tend to be associated with sweet uh and so on right um, and blue actually is associated with nothing because in in nature blue colors generally don't exist okay so that's a entirely separate issue so here's an interesting experiment suppose you have yellow colored candy uh and red colored candy these are artificial food colors but they're not natural so you know you can put any color you want and you add to the yellow colored candy you add strawberry flavor and you add a lime flavor to the red colored candy our brains will have trouble detecting them because our brains will have trouble associating red color with citrus and it will have trouble associating the yellow color with the flavor of strawberries right so color forms an important part of how we detect food and again a lot of this is cultural so different regions may have different preferences like for example uh a lot of the during the the mughal times there was sort of like this that's this persian persianate 
uh, preference for uh, food that was not yellow but white in color because uh, they they were they liked food to be white. So you find a lot of Mughlai recipes that have a lot of cashew paste, uh, Navratan korma, those kinds of things that tend to be whiter in color. And and the whiter you could get something, it was considered to be you know better and so on. Uh, but in many parts of India, people will not eat something that is white in color. Uh, and so on. And so there's, there are also regional preferences for this. The other interesting thing is that the shape of the food also uh, kind of fools our trick brains into uh, thinking about food in a different way. There's a great example, right? As Indians, we all know Cadbury's uh, dairy milk, right? Possibly one of, possibly the most popular chocolate in the history of uh, India along with Five Star, right? So uh, yeah, dairy milk, right? Dairy milk historically was square shaped, uh, meaning that it had straight lines. But the younger generation among you, you you might not know that it had straight lines because for the last decade or so, it has had curved lines. Right? When you get a dairy bit, it's now curved. The reason the company switched to a curved line is because uh, the uh, it just allowed them to save money. Uh, it's a, ph a phenomenon called shrinkflation, meaning that you know uh, you use the same amount but you use less chocolate, and curved spaces are generally uh, more volume efficient. Uh, so. Square lines, more volume, curved lines, less volume, right? You know, uh, and so on. So they made the top of those dairy milk more curved. Right? And immediately it turns out people started complaining that the new dairy milk is terrible uh, because it tastes way too sweet. Uh, they had not changed the recipe at all. All they had changed is the shape. And so it turns out that our tongue associates rounder shapes with uh, sweeter flavors and angular shapes with uh, not so sweet flavors, right? Um, and so... Uh, here's again an interesting thing for people who design some of these products is that you can even use some of these new ideas from gastrophysics and how you design some of these snacks to have less sugar uh, but still appear to be you know more sweeter and so on right so you'll find sweets tend to be generally rounder and not angular and so on right uh, so the other interesting thing is that uh, uh, movement in a sense that so the way we we look at food like if you observe a lot of these advertisements right uh there is a sense of constant movement, right? So there's always the cameras are spinning around. There's like a close down. There's a zoom. Uh, the food is always falling. It's always moving. Uh, because in general, we associate movement with life. Uh, and when things are still, uh, we we think it's dead uh, and so on. So so the reason I'm bringing, uh, bringing uh, some of these ideas uh, to you is the fact that how we think about food, how we think about Indian food is often loaded with such a lot of pseudoscience uh, and a lot of essentially personal experiences being passed off as general experiences so on we'll kind of talk about that so here's another example uh, your brain can be fooled by uh, priming meaning uh, that if your favorite ipl team won their match uh, then food will taste sweeter uh, and if your team lost the match your food is likely to taste bitter slightly bitter and so on, right? Uh, and so this is something that's been observed uh, as well, right? Uh, your state of mind, uh, depending on how emotional you are, how angry you are, that also affects how you perceive flavor. Now, uh, again, so the reason I'm putting all of this together is, is the fact that in general, I think we need to start realizing that flavor is such a uniquely individual experience. So I'm kind of getting to the point where I'm really about to say that you should disregard all negative reviews of restaurants uh, because people are essentially describing their personal experiences, uh, flavor experiences, and not really uh, adding anything of value in describing that food, even if they're a food critic. Anyway, we'll kind of get to that. Okay. So what I'm going to do um, is uh, sort of uh, end my talk by kind of talking about uh, some common scientific uh, pseudoscience misconceptions when it comes to Indian food, right? Um, and cooking in general, right? And then we'll kind of, you know, end and, you know, if necessary, we'll take some questions and answers. So I have sort of three legends. This is uh, your right. And, and, and these are the three visuals that I will use. Uh, the first one essentially means that I want you to reconsider why you think this works, right? So in cooking, you do many things, but the your explanation might be the wrong one, right? It might be working, but not for the reasons you think it's working. Right? So this is more of a clarification, mental model kind of thing. The second one is, I, I mean, this is just downright pseudoscience. Please ignore it. Uh, and the third one is, I literally have no words. Right? Uh, uh, and, and so these are the three categories of misinformation that I find uh, on Indian cooking. Like a very common one is a wider misconception that when it comes to dealing with starches, right, that adding oil to boiling water will prevent noodles from sticking. Uh, and I'll tell you why. I, although noodles are not technically sort of Indian food, at least uh, uh, in, in this part of the world. But what's interesting is that 
adding oil to the cooked down noodles works so when you add oil to water uh, it actually floats on top um, and it actually goes nowhere near the noodles so it makes sense after you dry the noodles and you add oil it will prevent it from sticking because oil again has a hydrophobic uh, uh, end that prevents making sure that two things that love water you know as long as there's an oil layer will not stick together right uh, so interesting thing is that in the context of indian cooking here's where you should actually add oil when you pressure cook dal you should add a small teaspoon of oil that will prevent the saponins in the dal from frothing and spoiling your pressure cooker and by the way those saponins are anti nutrients as well so again what the uh, literally what the oil does is that it prevents those saponins from causing that frothing uh, and so that way here's one situation where adding oil actually works but people think adding oil to boiling water actually works right uh, the other thing is that you have to knead really well to get a soft chapati uh no you don't you have to remember that there is a difference between atta in india and whole wheat flour as you as you might see in the west right whole wheat flour is made from the entire grain of wheat right and it is tremendously high on gluten and if you try to make chapati with whole wheat flour it's just rubber okay that flour is designed for bread it's not designed for chapati in india we take the wheat grain and run it through these two giant pieces of granite stone called a chakki um, and it damages a fair bit of the gluten so atta is basically whole wheat flour with damaged gluten right so you don't actually have to knead it you just have to let the unsalted dough sit for 30 minutes and it will really just knead itself right you don't need to uh, get any tremendous in fact you do not want strong gluten formation when you actually make a chapati because it makes it too chewy right so that's the thing right again remember more water softer eggs and milk the more fat you add to the the dough you get a flakier product so puri is less water more oil in the dough so you get a flakier puri kachori and, and so on right uh, the other element is that uh, you often notice that people believe that baking soda is bad for health no it actually is a the magical multi purpose ingredient that does a ton of things right uh, it can accelerate browning right if you want to brown onions quicker uh you can you can use a little bit pinch of baking soda uh in, in addition to obviously helping you make sure that your idlis are softer and so on uh it also breaks down pectin in cell wall so you can actually cook chana and all of these other hard legumes much quicker and use less energy right which i i think is a useful thing to do uh in 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 today's day so again we spoke about how microwaves are absolutely safe uh incidentally by the way uh you can take a fat water emulsion like coconut milk or yogurt uh and add spices to it uh and then any kind of canned vegetables or canned chickpeas and so on and make an instant sabji in about 5 to 6 minutes uh and it's quite delicious actually right so if you're if you're lazy if you're a student here's a absolutely quick way of course it'll it'll probably scandalize all those purists uh but it's absolutely delicious okay uh the other element is this feeling that somehow monosodium glutamate is a chinese conspiracy to cause brain damage uh no sodium is is essential to your body and glutamic acid is an amino acid uh your body has 2 kg of glu- uh, uh, glutamic acid as part of your muscles anyway right so 1 quarter teaspoon to improve the umami taste of something is not going to harm you unless uh you specifically have an allergy to your, uh, msg which again by the way you could have allergies to gluten as always right so you could always consider that first uh another common thing is that we believe indians believe pressure cooking is measured in whistles right because we don't use the electronic pressure cooker so we tend to uh believe that oh three whistles for rice and five whistles for dal and you know 15 whistles for chana and 20 whistles for you know rajma or urad dal and so on uh comes from a fundamentally sort of uh, uh uh wrong understanding of how pressure cooking works so pressure cooking works by cook time at peak pressure so you build pressure up there's a whistle that releases excess pressure reached peak pressure at that point you lower heat and then you measure time right so you can measure five you know six minutes for rice eight minutes for dal you know 12 minutes for chana chana dal 15 minutes for rajma and so on and that's also a more energy efficient way because you're not keeping the heat to a high uh, for like five whistles you know 12 whistles uh, and so on so so if you see any recipe that says please cook for five whistles well you know now you know you just need to cook for one whistle and then the rest is really just time right and again as much as possible you should avoid pressure cooking things like seafood uh, and chicken and so on because they get really really dry the only kind of meat you should be pressure cooking uh, is hard cuts of meat with bones uh, because you need temperatures above 90 celsius to be able to break down some of the tough sinewy connective tissue otherwise it gets really really hard right uh, 
other misconception about common indian food is that marination adds flavor to meat so you will you will see recipes that say please marinate this chicken for 48 hours and 62 hours and 72 hours and so on uh, i hate to break it to you it actually does absolutely nothing okay uh, so first and foremost going back to the example about rubbing ginger garlic paste on your hand if that ginger garlic paste is not getting into your body it's not going to get into inside the chicken either okay uh, we're ultimately made of similar things okay we're both animals in that sense okay what marination actually does is that you consider what a marinade has it has an acid typically here it's in the form of yogurt sometimes lime juice sometimes vinegar right a mix of acids it has a fat either ghee mustard oil whatever flavor you like some kind of fat it has spices and it has salt okay now spices essentially dissolve in the fats and then the acid denatures the protein on the surface allowing the fat and those spices to stick to the surface that is all marination is doing the spices are not actually getting inside what is getting inside is salt so if you really want to add flavor to meat soak your meat in salt water for uh, for an hour or so right again depending on the size etc but generally if you're using uh, cut pieces of chicken i think an hour is is typically good in eight percent salt the salt gets inside the uh, the meat makes it more flavorful also prevents it from becoming dry when you cook so it's a win-win so if you brine and then marinate nothing like it right and that's how you get the flavor on the outside you get the salt flavor inside so that's what so again you can save yourself time you don't need to do 72 hours of marination half an hour of marination is good enough for literally any dish right so this is how marination works and you don't need to over marinate and the last of the misconceptions is especially for people sitting in cities the idea the idea that fresh flawless looking vegetables if you go to the grocery store are actually fresh i hate to break it to you in india uh cities do not have uh sort of farms that are very close by so a lot of vegetables into indian cities tend tend to come from very far away right with the exception of few cities like bangalore that have a lot of farms just on the outside and again the climate allows bangalore to grow a range of uh, colder climate vegetables like potatoes and carrots etc right uh, but in general if you take other cities you can only either grow uh, vegetables that are tropical in nature like chennai you can only grow spinach and these things on the outside so uh, carrot in chennai is coming from at least 600 kilometers away right now for anything to come from 600 kilometers away it has to be harvested when it's unripe to survive storage and transportation um, and then they have to artificially figure out a way to keep it from ripening too fast and then they have to ripen it if necessary uh, using chemicals uh, otherwise it will be too raw uh, and then it gets into your store and then they have to use waxes to make sure that you know it's, it's not shriveling and losing moisture in the harsh light of the uh, your your grocery store and so on right now so in general what you think is fresh vegetables are often sometimes months old okay so that's number one depending on the vegetable uh, on the other hand your frozen carrots are actually super fresh because a frozen carrot is harvested at peak you know uh, taste and nutrition and frozen within hours and as long as it stays stayed in a freezer uh, or during the entire as long as you trust the cold chain chances are that it is actually fresher than the fresh carrot in an indian city right because the fact that carrots tend to grow in colder climates right so you have to really think about it so frozen vegetables in most cases people will tell you are unhealthy etc etc that's not true in fact, frozen vegetables in many situations are fresher and more nutritious than fresh vegetables, right? Because in biological activity, you have to remember, completely slows down uh, to, a, to nil at about less anything less than 15 Celsius, minus 15 Celsius, right? So at that point, time is frozen for all intents and purposes. Of course, certain things that tend to be high moisture are not great for freezing because again, because the uh, as we know, water expands ice is you know generally expands uh, compared to water is less dense and thus there is cellular damage in things that contain a lot of water but things like carrots i think are perfectly fine now the other the last thing that i wanted to say is the fact that uh plants that fight more pests during their life develop more flavor because as we remembered flavor is biological warfare that plants conduct against all these pests and microbes right so why do organic vegetables taste better because those plants are likely fighting a lot of these uh, 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 insects all the time and so they produce a lot more flavor in their vegetables right so 
here's an interesting tip for you if you go to the store and you want to pick a tomato right should you pick the most flawless largest looking tomato or should you pick the scarred small looking tomato you should pick the smaller scarred misshapen tomato because it's far more likely to have come from a plant that was attacked by pests and so it had fewer resources to put into the size but it put a lot more flavor because it produced chemicals that uh, defeated all those pests right so as in general as long as you're cooking or pretty much on the same day or the next day and not storing up for like a week which you shouldn't anyway um, it's generally better to go pick ugly vegetables do not pick good looking vegetables uh, because the ugly vegetables will have much much more flavor right so on that note i just want to sort of end by saying that um, you know this is a part of the world where people take food incredibly seriously i mean everyone takes food seriously in every part of the world but particularly so here so there's a great amount of pride uh, in the kind of flavors we have in the kind of diversity we have and in and in india's uh, and in this part of the world's ability to essentially take ingredients from every part of the world and yet make uniquely indian dishes right uh, and i often give the example of pav bhaji right uh, the word pav is portuguese in origin uh, the potatoes came from south america and were not cultivated in india pretty much till the late 1800s at any kind of scale right uh, uh, tomatoes came from mexico chilies and caps uh, the bell peppers and capsicum came from mexico uh, the carrots and uh, beans and cauliflowers were introduced by the british uh so in fact even till today if you go to small towns in tamil nadu they call them english vegetables as opposed to vegetables so carrot beans uh these are called english vegetables uh and so they were start they grew them in the hills near uti uh and that's how you know these things became common um, in south of india and so on right so when you really think about that it's fascinating not a single ingredient other than the spices in pav bhaji is of indian origin and yet it is the most uniquely indian of dishes right uh and so i think we need to rethink our idea of what authenticity means right uh this is such a spectacularly diverse part of the world uh, there is no one indian food right? in the same way that there is no european food right i mean italians would get mighty annoyed if you just say oh they are european food i mean i feel the same way about everything being indian food there isn't right uh the flavor profile of something in kashmir uh is just poles apart from uh what you might eat uh congealed goat blood curry that i eat in 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 say chennai right uh to fermented sort of pork uh in 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 the northeast uh, uh to to uh, you know a sweet uh, dal uh, in say gujarat these are just polar opposites this is such spectacular variety in eating cultures eating habits and again over time uh, because food is so central to identity food habits become enforced by small subcultures and castes and so on so that it's easier to maintain that tribal identity right so if you do not if you do not eat meat it's very difficult to eat meat later in life if you do not eat seafood very hard to eat seafood later in life right um, if you do not eat onion and garlic again very hard to eat it later in life and so on right so uh, so it's important to know your food right uh, you know I, I less i would worry less about how indian food is perceived around the world and all the rest of that uh, because i think first and foremost we first need to know our own food before we worry about how it's being perceived in the rest of the world right how it's perceived in the rest of the world is a function of soft power it's a function of colonialism in the past uh, it's a function of uh, soft power in the present uh, it's a function of also migratory patterns right so the first generation of first set of pe- people who went out of india happened to be punjabis who then sort of made punjabi kind of food popular and so indian food becomes sort of punjabi food and then you have like it guys you know techies software guys going in the 70s and 80s and so the second category of food is south indian idli dosa that sort of defines indian food uh, in the west and so on uh, but it's evident that i think as as over time uh, as soft power grows it's it's quite natural that we will st- stop using terms like indian food and instead start saying it's it's tamil food or it's konkanada food or it's malwani food or or it's say you know kolkata mughlai food very specifically and that's so on um and so on so and again the, from the point of view of also you know we spoke about frozen vegetables and all of that uh, sustainability itself uh, almost 90% of what we eat today uh, uh, we were not eating 100 years back okay uh, including the daily consumption of wheat and rice which is a function of uh, the food shortages and famines during the the colonial times and then you had the uh, the food security thing provided by the government only for wheat and rice as opposed to billets uh, and so it cu- 
basically convinced more farmers to ditch millets and basically go grow rice and, and wheat and so that changed our, our diets uh, in a sense the vegetables we eat are all completely unique uh, now they were not eaten uh, before um, and so it is so therefore i think history is not what should what you should be looking for to find identity in indian food but it's really the present uh, that you need, the sheer the diversity of things and the constant experiments and inventions uh, the indianization so i think we should celebrate uh, an indianized pasta as much as we celebrate uh, uh, a, you know a 5000 year old dish of, of some kind right uh, and so on right uh, we spoke about this we spoke about how flavor perception and nostalgia so the part of the brain that uh, deals with flavor is the same part of the brain that deals with nostalgia and memories that is why we are so deeply uh, personal about food right uh, and so when you say this is not good when something is not tasty you are actually only saying that this is unfamiliar to me because i have so many memories of dal so many memories of sambar so many memories of this dish that this particular version um, i don't have memories of and vast majority of people do not like novelty when it comes to food when it comes to comfort food when it comes to things they are familiar with right so that's why it's more likely that a south indian is going to be offended by the idea of a szechuan dosa in mumbai which is which is by the way a delicious thing but a person who grew up in mumbai did not grow up eating dosas will find a szechuan dosa to be a absolute riot of flavors right and so all negative opinions about food are really opinions about familiarity and not really opinions about any objective quality of the food itself you can have objective measurements of the food in terms of nutrition in terms of calories in terms of macronutrient balance and maybe basic things like oh too salty and even that by the way indians eat a tremendously high amount of salt uh i've i've had american colleagues at work say that forget spices i sometimes find indian food to be too salty uh so it's just that each culture develops different thresholds for what they consider to be an acceptable level of salt and it kind of varies between 0.5% by 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 mass of the food to about 2% at the peak right uh, in case of some things like indian food and so on right uh and so likewise as i said geography does not lend authenticity to food right uh people do right and uh food always evolves from migration from historical events that you you do not have control over now uh so it would be equally silly to say oh by the way chilies are not indian because they were introduced by colonial powers uh, and stop eating chilies there would be no indian food without chilies but, and yet uh, chilies were not a major part of indian food till very 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 recently right uh, so that's what i sort of wanted to kind of talk about and uh, on that note thank you so if you guys have any questions or oh, we can take those and so let me stop sharing my screen Yeah. Thank you so much, Chris, for your interesting talk. You really explained the science behind or about the Indian cooking in such a way that people before your talk might be taking the science as a rocket science, but it is not now. Uh, now we can take a few of the questions uh, from the audience here. So, Dr. Piros. Wonderful presentation, sir. I have one question. So, is browning of food a good habit practice because? Uh, by the millard reaction i'm talking about because if you follow the literature they claim that it may end up in the formation of acrylamide by the reaction of a amino acid such as asparagine with with yep. some of the reducing sugar so is it just a pseudo science or misconception or what is it no, no absolutely not so, so I, because it's a millard reaction happens at above 100 celsius so as you kind of get towards towards the 160 170 celsius you are on the borderline between burning food okay And, and and so essentially what happens is that uh you often have to be careful right so any very dark browning uh, is going to produce a few of these acrylamide and those kinds of compounds so uh, in general that's why eating grilled foods which have a lot of charring uh on a daily basis is not recommended uh, that you're going to consume a ton of things that are carcinogenic and therefore increase your risk of doing that so yes so it's it's not a wrong thing so yeah absolutely uh you must brown in moderation uh, and and in general i think uh, eating brown foods three times a day may also not be a great idea so again in moderation uh, i think yes but at the end of the day as i say i think flavor comes from that so uh, and in general you, you it you should always enjoy food 
but eat it in moderation so so absolutely uh, when it comes to any kind of deep frying and sort of heavy duty browning it is going to cross into the burning territory towards the higher end so you have to be gentle about it yes absolutely yeah. any idea sir what is the frequency of formation of acrylamide like because it's a carcinogen like how frequent it so can i i think no so after uh, uh, after about 160 celsius or so uh, you are you are going to risk producing some amount and then again remember that uh, so uh, a lot of these things about acrylamide and those kinds of things you also have to think about the dosage okay. uh, so uh, it's not the poison or the carcinogen that matters it is the amount you are ending up and therefore uh, that amount again is associated with the probability uh, uh, your body may very well be able to discard it and deal with it in, in small quantities right uh, so i don't quite know at the top of my head in terms of how many it is produced it probably needs a little bit more research but but in general i think you will be safe if you are just mindful about what you're cooking right so uh, if you're not blackening too many things yeah hello sir Hello, sir. This is Anuradha Patil. Wonderful presentation, sir. Thank you for breaking at least fifteen to twenty misconceptions I had about food. Uh, so my question was: uh, You spoke something about microwave not being uh, hazardous uh, while cooking food, right? So, what is your take on uh, refrigeration? So that is my one question. And the second part of that question is um, the material, the the cookware that we use. Does that play any part in the nutrient value of that food? Thank you, sir. So, sure. So let's take refrigeration. See, both uh, both microwave and uh, fridges are relatively new to Indian cooking. Uh, so, so in a sense that so uh, within living memory, like for example, my grandmother never used refrigerators all her life, most of her life. She started using it much later. and as i said you know when it comes to cooking you have to remember that food is the only foreign object that we willingly put into our bodies um, every day okay uh, and so in the past uh, putting the wrong thing into your body is the distinction the difference between life and death right so historically every culture is very dead serious about food rules how to cook etc because in the absence of things like refrigerators spoilage is happening in real time so you cook a meat gravy it is in half an hour it it can be quite dangerous right so so when you think about uh, which is why you know you take a lot of meat gravies tend to be very sour they add a lot of acids to again they add a lot of spices uh, to increase the room temperature shelf life of things like that so you have to remember that all our ancient wisdom about safety in food uh, presumes that refrigerators don't exist the problem is when suddenly this new thing comes you can't change people's minds that easily so they will resist it and they will still think no 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 this is not right because nothing in my past knowledge uh, is able to explain the fact that i can keep a dal for like 2 days in the uh, in the in the fridge and eat it perfectly safely right rice may be less so because i think uh, rice does develop a certain bacteria uh, after about 24 hours cooked rice uh, but anything else you can keep for 2 3 days pretty safely as long as you don't have a power cut and so on right uh, so the so largely this has to do with the fact that there is a resistance to change take older ideas and then apply them and change them uh, that's the problem with old ideas that people don't want to change them right so refrigeration again is 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 perfectly safe uh, and it's an absolute uh, in the indian kitchen because otherwise uh, here's the interesting thing uh, uh, on a side note without refrigeration uh, we w- women wouldn't be working in india they just be sitting at home and cooking three meals every day okay you you have to re- you have to recognize that sort of you know, the the thing that modernity brings you these the shortcuts the stoves and all of that right uh, and again it's quite interesting you look at india and see over the last 30 40 years uh, which are the states where women started going to schools and uh, going to work before other states and first you will find that uh, the states where rice is eaten women go to work first Okay. Uh, they go because rice is very quick easy one shot you can make for the family etc etc it's only half an hour of cooking south indian cooking is half an hour make sitting and making parathas in punjab is like a 3 hour exercise okay uh, and you have to you have to do it one by one every girl in the family has to be sitting and making parathas all day right so this is one so rice versus wheat is one uh, angle the second angle is quite interesting is the adoption of newer devices like refrigeration so therefore you will find that states where which electrified first and had reliable electrical connections and had enough wealth where uh, 
people were able to buy afford fridges you will find that women started going to work and started go, uh, in, in the 1950s and 60s and you would find that places like maharashtra places like tamil nadu and kerala are those places where uh, the, there was enough wealth for people to be able to afford fridges and therefore get used so once so what happens is that once you get kind of get used to the fridge you're like no there is no way i'm doing without it right so therefore there is no so obviously all food loses nutrition over time uh but i think that's not the way to think about nutrition right uh you should think about nutrition by thinking about how much you eat and what you eat uh, rather than whether you're losing nutrition by cooking by frying by putting in refrigerator so that is much much less of a factor actually Hello, sir. Myself, uh, Rishikant Rajdeepak. Uh, I would like to ask about that tricking your mind regarding that familiar and unfamiliar taste. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, actually, my personal experience is that I'm open to new taste. Yes. So, wherever I've gone across India, I've always liked a new taste. So, yes. uh, so it's very hard that I say that. Oh, okay. I do not like this taste. Uh, I have one example uh, like yes. uh, dark chocolate. I have not liked it. So that is one example yeah. which I have not liked, but mostly I like yes. the thing. Yep. Uh, actually, I have forgotten what I wanted to ask. <laughs> 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 uh, so no, I'm you asking. Know, uh, so dark, dark chocolate tends to do that too. Thinking about chocolate tends to do that. Too. Yes. <laughs> So, is it possible to uh, trick someone's mind regarding new taste? Because I have seen some people who do not adopt to new taste. But uh, uh, what happens that if you say, I may be wrong, it is just a hypothesis. If I say someone that this will taste very good, and when that guy tastes it first time, then it may happen that uh, it will taste good to him, but not the other guy whom I have not told such thing. So this yeah. is one hypothesis which I want you to comment on. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah. Okay. So, so for starters, I think yes. One is that you'd be in a minority. Um, a very, very small percentage of people um, sort of uh, appreciate novelty uh, when it comes to food, right? So it requires a very specific, slightly bold mindset. Uh, so, so, so for example, people like you who are willing to. literally try anything at least once right uh, are also the kind of people who will happily jump out of plane do skydiving uh, do hiking and so essentially it's that same mindset so people who have an adventurous mindset uh, tend to be open to putting very strange things into their mouth the vast majority of people uh, who if you put them out of a plane and say here's a parachute now go jump they will simply not put any strange thing into their mouth uh, and like it's it's just the same way right um So that said, um, uh, I, I I think as I said, see, you know, it also has to do with uh, even within that, sometimes people are willing to appreciate newer flavors if it does not overlap with any memories they already have. Like for example, uh, a, a person who just grew up, say, eating, uh, say, let's say a person who grew up eating say uh, food in south india like with south indian flavors uh, and again even somebody who eats meat right chicken curry in south india right um will be okay eating say a samosa for the first time in their life because it's nothing like what they have had in in the south right but they'd find butter chicken to be very terrible because they'll say no this is too sweet i simply cannot associate that chicken curry can be sweet and it can be so creamy for me chicken curry has to be filled with chilies and fiery and hot and spicy and sour like i get it in the south but it cannot be butter chicken uh, like thing but they are okay with they are okay to experiment with samosa because it's nothing like what they eat so even there as i said the less familiar you are you are far more likely to be able to experiment even amongst people who are afraid so that's one way of introducing people that try and introduce them to things that they are absolutely not likely to have any memories of as opposed to things that are different versions of what they've already eaten before right so that is clearly one thing so uh, the other thing that i wanted to say about uh, dark chocolate particularly is that here's a very interesting science tip right so dark chocolate obviously i think uh, theobromin is bitter okay so that's the primary sort of molecule in uh, in, in chocolate like caffeine it, it is bitter okay um uh, and uh, but chocolate contains a lot of fat and this is cocoa butter 
right and cocoa butter actually melts at about 35 celsius a very important point okay it is solid till it is 35 celsius and then it melts normally when you take a chocolate at least in india people tend to keep the chocolate unfortunately they keep the chocolate in the fridge okay in the west you can keep the chocolate outside it won't melt but in india it will melt so they keep the chocolate in the fridge so when the chocolate comes out of the fridge it is at around uh, you know 4 to 5 celsius you know pretty quickly by the, by your hand warm it will be 10 celsius by the time you bite into it okay so the cocoa butter is at 10 celsius when you bite okay and that cocoa butter will not melt until it reaches 35 celsius okay and once the cocoa butter melts it will basically give all the other aromas inside chocolate and it will just explode because when fats dissolve with your mouth that's why you know we spoke about how oil dissolves flavors it's the same thing all the chocolate flavors dissolve in the cocoa butter and you get an explosion of flavor okay so part of the problem is all indians are eating dark chocolate the wrong way because they're just biting into it chewing it and saying no this is just too bitter etc etc you have to put the chocolate in your mouth and just wait for couple of minutes once it melts and your your chocolate reaches 35 celsius which is your body temperature around 36 37 celsius right you will see the insane explosion of flavor so the key to eating dark chocolate is to just keep it in your mouth and don't bite for a while till it literally melts in your mouth and then you will then you will stop eating other chocolates you will find milk chocolate and everything else to be very sub, very low quality because this amount of flavor is there only in dark chocolate right so that's how you eat dark chocolate so uh, asok we have a few questions online those are joining online us so uh, yeah so might we you can yeah, see so that i can uh, so i, I can answer so, so okay i say i say there's a question ayurveda honey and ghee in equal proportion is considered poisonous uh so as heating honey in western countries we tend to see meat is marinated grilled uh what do you think about this so again as i said in in, in due respect to with due respect to ayurveda right uh, and i think a scientist recently talked about this that in science there are uh there are observations the 80% of science is recording observations okay. and then you make hypotheses okay and then you formulate theories to explain why these things happen these are three entirely different steps okay right and often in many cases done by different people okay right so you make observations gather large amounts of data etc etc you hypothesize and you say okay if i do this this will happen if i do this this will happen and then you theorize okay here's 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 the interesting thing ayurvedic observations ayurvedic hypotheses are all fantastic this is wisdom that we need to protect and we need to make sure that we understand because it's largely come from years and years of years of practical experience seeing trying this plant trying that herb trying this etc trying combination seeing what works etc etc so absolutely you should take them seriously okay here's what i think you should ignore yeah, and this might be controversial ignore ayurvedic theories again the reason is very simple because theorizing requires you to have a deeper understanding of biology and molecular biology and cellular biology and you need microscopes you need gas chromatographs all of which are very modern day inventions right so remember that observations and hypotheses about the world can come from practical wisdom theories require a deeper understanding of the world and we have unfortunately what ayurveda needs to do is to update its theories so that in the light of modern day meta models about the world right so i think the article that again this sort of came in the hindus is say that respect the observations respect the uh, hypotheses but ignore the theories right uh, and i'll i'll put it in a very lighter way okay cooking is largely been done by women okay over history okay uh, and a lot of the wisdom of in fact the observations of which plant works etc it's very possible that it is it is essentially women who recorded this and passed on that knowledge it's your grandmother who knows all of the when you have a fever what plant to drink and what combination of ghee and ginger and pepper will calm the soothe your throat it's, it's your grandmother who has that practical knowledge right and guess who has no practical knowledge but only has theories it's your grandfather so in general when it comes to cooking okay listen to your grandmother and don't listen to your grandfather he has no clue okay and so the same thing with ayurveda observations and uh, hypotheses are your grandfather theories are from grandfathers who never did any cooking in their lives so as i said i think specific examples like say you know you should not mix dairy and uh, fish etc etc 
you can disprove them by simply seeing the fact that the Mediterranean people mix dairy and fish all the time. And they live 20 years longer than Indians do. And they are, are some of the healthiest people with the lowest rates of uh, cardiovascular disease and, you know, and diabetes anywhere in the world. right? Um, and so you almost always, I think the problem is that sometimes people who came up with these theories didn't know that Mediterranean exists and ja Japanese food exists. They didn't know any of these things. right? So as I always said, trust the practical knowledge and ignore the theories is, is what I would say. Okay? Viren Joy essentially says that... Uh, uh, you spoke about how often frozen vegetables are healthier. Could you elaborate a little more on the frozen foods which are deep fried such as nuggets and other substances? Okay, so they're entirely different things. Uh, frozen vegetables are fine. Okay, the, the vegetables we tend to freeze, typically things like, you know, peas and carrots and so on, right? Uh, but uh, frozen uh, deep fryable foods are an entirely different category. So in general, I think any kind of deep fried food, you have to be eating in moderation. So there is no distinction between them being fresh versus them being frozen, uh, uh, to be honest. Uh, uh, because I think literally almost all restaurant food uh, is any kind of nuggets, etc. are going to be frozen and deep fried. Any French fries are going to be frozen and deep fried. That's not a problem. Uh, really, there is little or no difference in that sense. I mean, let's put it this way, right? The marginal difference between a frozen version and an unfrozen version is nothing compared to the fact that you're eating something deep fried. So it is like uh, it is like bank robbery happened, right? And then there was a pickpocket that happened outside. Uh, but you have to focus on the bank robbery, not on the pickpocket. Okay, so that's 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 the point I would actually say, right? Um, so Bahubali uh, Shira Shiragapur wants to know if packed food grains masala, good idea to again. As I said, uh, you have to. It's a never look at these things in an absolute sense. Okay. Uh, it's a multivariable problem where you have to look at convenience. You have to look at. Uh, you also have to look at uh, the amount of time you have. You know how much you, time you're willing to invest. You have other problems there, the other things to do in life, and so on. Versus health and nutrition. So individual choices of should I use packet masala or not is uh, uh, is often not a uh, the right way to think about it. Okay? Uh, if you don't have time, by all means use it. Uh, but I only thing I would say store your powdered masalas in the in the freezer. Don't store them in your kitchen uh, because these uh, powdered masalas will lose aroma very, very quickly. And again, you want to keep them in the freezer. Okay? Uh, the second thing is that, again, if you can actually get a small coffee grinder, uh, you're almost always going to get better, stronger aromas uh, if you grind the masalas fresh. Uh, and it doesn't take much, right? So again, it's a question of, again, if you like stronger flavors, you know, by all means. But you can always add a little bit more powdered masala, by all means. So I do not want to judge people who use powdered masalas. But again, I think there's just a better way of doing it. Uh, same thing with uh, packed food grains uh, as well, right? At the end of the day, see, packaging uh, generally tends to require uh, the fact that it cannot spoil during storage, etc., etc. So there will be a few additives that will be there to prevent moisture, to prevent bacteria, etc., etc. Uh, again, there is very little evidence that uh, in the amounts that they are used, that they are you know, harmful and so on. But again, as I said, in general, the focus should be on eating a mix of things. Eat uh, cooked food, raw food, frozen food, unfrozen food, uh, you know, something that come out of a packet, something that you cook fresh. Just eat a mix of everything and eat in moderation. I think you'll generally be fine. All right, and Suraj Pillai wants to know which is more safe, refrigerated non-vegetarian food packages or refrigerated vegetarian food packages. Um, so in, in general, uh, you should be more careful about uh, meat uh, because meat uh, spoils faster, right? Uh, and, and therefore, it tends to require more preservatives as well, right? So generally, you have to be a little bit more careful about a meat than you have to be about top plants, right? All right. And I think, uh, yeah, so I think those, that's the end of the questions. Yes. This is Varsha. So I would like to ask that you said that you should not uh, use liquid food except breast milk. But uh, nowadays, people are looking towards the nutritious food, like liquid food only. Uh, for example, Herbalife Nutrition. Most of the educated people are looking towards that and they are taking in a regular yeah. way for a lifetime. Yeah. They are doing it. So, what do you say about this one? See, as I said, I think, in, see, let's just put it this way. Right? In general, our guts are not good at counting liquid calories. Okay? Now, if that person is drinking some uh, herbal milkshake or whatever drink, right? Uh, and they still have the willpower to overcome their hunger pangs and not eat, not overeat. And they're healthy. 
good for them i i do not as i said i do not want to criticize people's food choices right i'm just here to say that look here's what the science is uh if you are someone who believes that a f- like here's the thing right fruit juices are terrible you should just eat the fruit fruit juice is essentially take all the bad things from the fruit put it in the juice and throw all the good stuff out that's what a fruit juice is okay so and plus the fact that your body doesn't as not able to count those calories meaning that you drink a fruit juice then you'll eat a full breakfast anyway and get 100 calories from that juice so this is so so again as i said the average person who does not have time to think about what they're eating etc they should be wary that eating calories eating liquid calories is a is a very risky thing and again getting rid of liquid calories is a very easy fix because it's very dead simple to say i won't eat juices i won't eat milkshakes as much as possible or if i really like it i'll do it once a week i mean let's put it that way right uh, again because denying yourself also doesn't work so you have to be able to uh, sort of enjoy food as well so eat in moderation right so again remember you're eating a cup of tea or coffee uh, those are liquid calories right so uh, anything with milk with sugar is liquid calories right we're saying coke and pepsi yeah but your your cup of tea is some 120 130 calories easily okay uh, and so but remember that your body is not great at counting those and you'll happily have three cups of tea and eat full meals so here's the thing if you ate those 130 calories in the form of solid food that will reduce your intake of other food but tea and coffee will never reduce that so be wary of that right so uh, that's all there is to it so it's being mindful it's not about saying no 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 don't do it right so that's really all there is Okay. I think it's on mute. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's Professor Vinayak Sathya. Hey, I have a question about because almost every Indian family we use tadka. Don't you do that? Yes. So the oil yes. we use, the oil we use, there are so much you know different opinions about what kind of oil. I uh, mean, cold press or the different varieties, sesame oil, olive oil, and all that, and the yeah. temperature, temperature of that. That can you yes. uh, show the light on yes. that? Yeah. So, so in general, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about oils in general. Okay. Um, and you have to remember that uh, uh depending on the kind of oil the cold pressed version of the oil will have different smoke points smoke point is the temperature at which the oil starts to burn um, and it's going to produce a bunch of uh, uh molecules that are not good for you right so on the longer run again on the longer run right so so in general uh here's what i would say right uh using extra virgin oils for very high temperature use cases like deep frying is not a great idea okay in the context of a tadka it's a very small amount of oil uh, and you're just blooming the the spices uh, and again i would say don't heat if you're using cold press oils don't heat that cold press oil to like smoking temperature see people have the sense that somehow if you if you put the mustard it has to burst right away Uh, as if it's some sort of a huge if and if it doesn't burst oh the oil is not hot enough no it was just a ancient heuristic for testing temperature it's it nothing to do with nutrition at all you can absolutely had the uh, mustard and the uh, uh, cumin etc etc when the oil is even slightly cooler if anything you will get more flavor into the oil okay so it doesn't have to be like blazing hot right now uh, but again we like that sizzle and that sound so it's a sonic uh, thing that we are obsessed with so all i would say is that if you're using refined oil you can use any temperature it doesn't really matter okay because refined oils do not contain anything other than the fats that's the whole point of refining right uh, cold press oils tend to contain things that are not fat and those things tend to burn at high temperatures uh, so in general i would say if you're deep frying please only use refined oil okay? like making puri and all that okay at samosa frying samosa and all that uh, if you are doing tadka and you want to use a cold press oil don't overheat the oil till it's like blazing hot uh and if the mustard sputters like instantly as soon as you put it it's probably uh, uh too hot now here's here's the point different cold press oils also have different uh, uh you know smoke points like for example coconut and mustard oil are pretty safe meaning that even the extra virgin variants have very high smoke points okay. so you're generally safe but groundnut sesame and others tend to have lower smoke points when they are extra virgin so you have to be a little bit more careful so if you're using so if you're bengali or if you're uh, malayali no problems just use your just heat it to whatever the t- temperature you want for tadka you're fine but if you're using peanut oil or using gra- uh, your sesame oil you might want to uh, uh, if you're using cold press then use it at a lower temperature 
it's on mute i think yeah so uh, great so we have one more question so the question is uh, the teenagers those are going to gyms and all uh, like they, they eat whey protein right it is good for health or not i mean uh, what is your own take on that right. so again so rule number one uh, so never ask personal health and nutrition questions to to a person who is not a doctor or a nutritionist so p- part of the reason of why there is so much misinformation is that uh, that people tend to trust people who are not experts so individual so i can give you generic advice about what oil is safe etc at that level because it's universal knowledge see because something like whey protein uh, and uh, health and personal you know fitness etc etc is very deeply personal right so what happens is that uh everybody metabolizes different proteins different foods in their own way and there is a genetic component to it uh so there is so in general you should mistrust any universal advice right so it's hard for me to say yeah it's safe versus saying no 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 it's bad both of those are wrong actually uh, the question is it depends if it works for you great right if you do not have if you do not run into other problems then you should be fine again talk to your doctor right if you have if you face any problems uh whey protein is just milk protein from milk right there are two kinds of proteins casein and whey so on the face of it there's really no uh this thing and an indian vegetarian diets tend to be I forget indian vegetarian indian diets tend to be low on protein okay uh that even meat eaters don't eat enough uh, they don't eat meat daily okay uh, and so in general as adults on an average unless we pay very close attention our diets are protein deficient uh so therefore for people who are going to you know gyms etc and do who are damaging their muscles and do need the extra protein uh again you might want to consider uh, again that it's always better if you can just eat eggs uh, if you can right or 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 eat uh, or eat meat right but if you do not eat eggs or meat uh, but you're okay with dairy uh then fine i think you know uh, you have to remember that paneer is fine but it comes with a lot of fat so you got to be wary of that okay uh whey protein again is just the protein isolate so you're better soy protein again is just the protein isolate uh, from the from the soy comes as the after they remove the oil soybean oil you get uh, that so also fine right uh again try and mix it up right so uh, try not to eat like whey protein uh, like try and mix it up there are other kinds of protein also available there are pea protein rice protein wheat protein powders available uh try and mix and match and again as much as possible try and get the protein into your diet directly as opposed to eat these supplements is essentially what i'd say other than that you know talk to your doctor is what i would tell you yes yeah thank you very much yeah yes. so uh, we can move to the uh, next session the second session we have uh, from uh, professor fuller uh, dorian ku fuller is a professor of archaeobotany at university college london he works on past agriculture system and plants domestication through archaeological research in several regions including sub-saharan africa near east south asia and china he works with several projects in sudan ethiopia and india he is the author of trees and woodlands of south india archaeological perspective and he is a co-editor of far from health 2019 archaeology of african plant plant use 2014 and climate landscape and civilization 2012 he completed his uh, ba at yale university in 1995 and phd on the emergence of agriculture societies in south india at cambridge university in 2000 he joined uh, ucl as a faculty in uh, 2000 again uh, this is just 0.001% description about his bio uh, with the limited time we can't explain like more things and all about uh, his uh, experiences awards and all so let's welcome him uh, in this session uh, professor fuller will talk about uh, the topic that is between baking and boiling indigenous and adapted elements in diversity of early indian uh, cooking traditions so let's welcome him Oh, well, hello, thank you. Uh, so, uh, as with the previous speaker, I'm going to now try to share my screen. Um, Please share the button. Use share button. So there's a uh, share share option at bottom. I think uh, plus yeah. sign with the screen somewhere at the bottom. If you go to the bottom, yeah. So the first option is mute. Uh, then stop. Yes, it is there. Yeah, it, yeah. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah, we can see that. Okay, 
Great. Um, yeah. So I'm 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 a, as you, as you heard an archaeologist who works on uh, preserved plants, and so I'm very interested in food and agriculture. And what I'm going to do today is um, give you a bit of a kind of broader perspective on how, uh, in particular, South early South Indian cooking fits comparatively into other parts of into what we know about early cooking in other parts of Eurasia. Uh, now, to get there, I'll, do, I'll, I'll start with a little bit of background. Now, we're not going to really talk about plant domestication and the origins of agriculture uh, today. That's although what I, what I often um, work on. But it's, it's worth uh, keeping a few things in mind. So uh, agriculture is something that develops in uh, actually quite late in human history. So if we think about uh, modern humans as a species evolving maybe 400,000 or 500,000 years ago uh, in Africa and spreading out uh, in the last sort of 70,000 years to other parts of the world, including including India. Um, agriculture develops in the past 10,000 years, but it's had a huge impact on the world. Of course, it's changed landscapes. So I very much look at agricultural landscapes as artifacts, human constructed uh, you know, a human modification of, of, of natural materials to create these landscapes, uh, and it moves species around uh, into places that they wouldn't normally occur. Uh, and of course, it, it's resulted in uh, the, the potential for very large scale human population growth. So estimates of global human population 10,000 years ago, uh, of course, are, are not straightforward, but somewhere between five and 10 million people globally you know, so that's smaller than most uh, large cities today for the whole earth. And of course, we're uh, well past 7 uh, billion now. And India, of course, is uh, one of the most populous countries now. So that's agriculture has allowed that to occur. Now, agriculture began in many different places around the world. So this is one of my uh, maps from a paper a few years ago um, with the colored blobs showing uh, regions that are considered um, plausibly independent centers of domestication, plants and animals, so centers of, of the origins of agriculture. Um, and what this map does is it divides them into two groups, those that are early. So the yellow ones are places where we think the beginnings are older than uh, 8,000 years ago, so what we call early Holocene. And the ones in green are places where the domestication process is somewhere between 8,000 and 4,000 years ago. So what we would call Middle Holocene. So what you can see is there's about 20 to 24 places around the world where agriculture develops. Some of those have a, have a, a much wider impact in that the crops or the animals domesticated in that region spread out. And so all those arrows coming out of Southwest Asia, spreading across Europe, spreading east towards Central Asia and India uh, shows the, the, the kind of major uh, uh, significance of the domestication in Southwest Asia, which includes species like wheat and barley and sheep and uh, and goats and chickpea, you know, so, so that it's had a, a, a major impact. You can also see similarly arrows spreading out of the domestications in China and out of Mesoamerica. So that's a kind of general background. And you'll see there's a number of little green blobs within the South Asian subcontinent. And these are regions which I've argued for a number of, of years look like independent centers for domestication and the development of plant cultivation uh, within South Asia, although they tend to be uh, on the younger side, so sort of 5,000 years ago rather than 10,000 years ago. Now, one of the things that's interesting is when we look at these, archaeologists tend to refer to these early agricultural uh, cultures as the Neolithic, so the New Stone Age. Um, but I would contend that the New Stone Age is not the same everywhere. So there's lots of different versions of the Neolithic that develop in different parts, parts of the world. And one of the interesting contrasts that we can see between these, these uh, regions where we get early domestication is in the technologies of cooking. Uh, and one of those obvious things is whether these early cultivators and early farmers have cooking pots or they don't have cooking pots. So we can kind of divide and here I've just taken the old world, so Eurasia and Africa, and you've got your different centers of domestication there. There's some, like Southwestern Asia, where the origins of agriculture and domestication takes place in the pre-pottery Neolithic. That means it takes place without any cooking pots. 
uh, and that, then that, that zone of a kind of pre-ceramic Neolithic stretches from Greece in the west to Pakistan and the Indus Valley uh, in the east. Uh, and of course, the, the crops like wheat and barley are coming out of that, that what we call the Fertile Crescent, that kind of green arc uh, in the middle of that zone. And in this area, domestication, the beginnings of agriculture, takes place thousands of years before anybody decides or, or, or to develop cooking pots. So that means the cooking methods are non-pottery based, they're non-boiling based. Um, and, and as I'll argue in this talk, that, set, that, that creates a kind of longer term, larger scale tradition of cooking focused on roasting and focused on baking and the development of ovens uh, that in a sense still characterizes uh, Western Eurasia today. Now that we can contrast it with both parts of sub-Saharan Africa, the Saharan, the Southern Saharan region, which I've got a little green uh, dashed line around, which is where crops like uh, um, Bajra and Jowar, pearl millet and sorghum originate in that region. Um, that takes place after thousands of years after pottery has already been developed by hunter-gatherer peoples. And that's also true in Eastern Asia. So when we look at evidence from China and Japan, uh, and parts of uh, southern southeastern Siberia, the Russian Far East, the evidence is that cooking pots developed uh, 16,000 to 18,000 years ago, almost 10,000 years before we have domesticated plants or agriculture. So again, boiling is developed as a cooking method amongst hunter-gatherers in that region. So there's some major east-west contrast. And I'm going to first develop that contrast before we then look at uh, uh, southern India that kind of lies between. So we can ask how is so then you know, similar or different between these. And these, these two sets of pictures I have on the left and right in, in a sense is, is, is an attempt to uh, contrast that. So we have a, a, a bread baking oven there, which I photographed in Peshawar in Pakistan uh, many years ago now, uh, where some naan is being cooked on the wall of the oven. These kind of clay ovens, uh, tanurs or firin, depending on which language one uses, where you stick the flatbread on the wall of the oven, those actually go back to the very beginnings of agriculture in southwestern Asia. And of course, they don't require uh, cooking pots. And they are related uh, technologically to uh, a modern oven. So we have a, a medieval depiction from Europe of a kind of pizza type oven, a, a village oven. Uh, and uh, and the bottom is just, a, you know, a, a, a picture off the internet of a modern a modern European kitchen. And right in the center of that modern European kitchen is an oven for baking. I want to contrast it with the kitchen on the right. So the kitchen on the right is faculty housing at Peking University, uh, where I, where I, I stayed a few years ago. It's a it's a, a modern build for you know university professors. There's the cooking area. There is no oven. So your typical kitchen in Beijing or Shanghai, there is no oven because of course there's no tradition of baking. So why would you have an oven? It, it, it serves no, no function in the cooking tradition. And that goes right the way back. So if we go back to the early Neolithic, we have this tripod, uh, that's actually late Neolithic, but this tripod vessel with hollow legs. Uh, and that's so you can boil water and put another pot on top to steam things. And this kind of technology of boiling and steaming is very well developed in China uh, by 7,000 years ago in the Neolithic. Uh, and the developments on that are all about uh, boiling, simmering, and steaming. So there's these different cooking traditions that we can trace right the way for, to the modern kitchen, actually from back at the dawn of agriculture. Now, uh, cooking, as we've already heard about very elegantly from our previous previous speaker, is one of these things that really makes us, us, makes us human. It's something that all humans share. We cook foods, and that makes humans different from any other species uh, currently on the planet or any species that's lived in the past, apart from our uh, immediate ancestors. And that's, of course, it breaks down various uh, things. And this is just a, a, um, an experiment looking at the deg degrees of uh, polymerization of, uh, of, of compounds coming out of plants with more cook heating time. Uh, it makes foods, uh, in a sense, it does some of the digestion outside the body, right? Uh, and it potentially makes foods more edible more nutritious, uh, more storable. So that's something that's shared by humans and it's using this heat as a mediating uh, a factor. Now, not all foods are, um, not all processing techniques are equal. So the challenge is that of course, plants contain a lot of uh, food material, but some of that food material lies behind cell walls, which are cellulose. Sometimes they contain some lignin and those are essentially indigestible 
for humans. So we have to process foods to make them digestible. Now, heating might break down starch, but if that starch is still contained behind cell walls, um, it, it may be that it just passes right through the human body without being digested, and experiments have shown that. So there's, a, there's an idea from a Harvard uh, anthropologist, Richard Rangham, and he wrote a book about 20 years ago called, uh, maybe it's about 15 years ago, called Catching Fire, uh, and argues that this is partly what makes us human, is this uh, use of fire to cook by making many many foods more digestible and allowing the, the kind of uh, human gut system to reduce evolutionarily. And if you spend less, uh, you put less tissue into your digestive system, you can put more tissue into your brain system. So brains get bigger and intestines get shorter over the course of human evolution. And in broad terms, he's right, but he's partly wrong in that the edibility and digestibility of different plant foods actually depends on the interaction between the specifics of that plant structure and its cell walls and your processing and cooking methods. Um, and, and this just shows some work of a former student of mine, Michelle Wollstonecroft, who did a number of uh, experimental um, plant processing uh, experiments working on a, on a sedge tuber, a wild tuber, uh, a Bulboscinus meritimus, which is very commonly found on early uh, agricultural and pre-agricultural sites in Southwest Asia. That's why this species that turns up a lot. It's a little sedge tuber uh, and it's full of starch. The problem with it is, is that starch is, is held behind very thick cell walls. The other, the, uh, the other sedge tuber that we might be familiar with is what's often called in English Chinese water chestnut, that you get slices of in Chinese stir fries and it's very, very crunchy. And the thing about these tubers is as you heat them, those cell walls harden and thicken, uh, which gives it that nice crunchy texture. But it means that any cells that are complete, the starch within them is completely indigestible because your your gut is not your stomach is not able to break down that cell wall. Uh, and so what she was able to show is that, and that's very different from say the potato, which has cell walls that dissolve immediately upon heating. Within five minutes of heating, even dry heat, cell walls within potatoes start to break down. So all that starch becomes um, accessible. So she contrasted same processing between potatoes and the sea club brush. And what that what 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 that what that showed is that if you have a technology where you where you grind things, you pulverize and pound and grind things, first that physically breaks down the cell wall. And then when you cook them, there's lots of carbohydrates and calories in these sedge tubers. Uh, but if you if you roast them whole or boil them whole, they have almost no caloric value. So processing techniques matter for uh, foodstuff choice. That's the kind of, uh, I, I suppose, the, the broader point. The other thing to realize from um, the evolution of our species is that we have evolved to eat a lot of starch. So at least within European and, and American kind of modern mythology, there's a lot of people who practice what's called the paleo diet, where they say, oh, it's healthier to eat like cavemen or something. Uh, and so you shouldn't eat bread, you shouldn't, you should eat lots of of meat and nuts and things like that, uh, that's kind of nonsense. It's clear that we have evolved as a species to digest starch, and we see that in the genetics relating to amylase enzymes. So amylase enzymes are produced in the pancreas, but also in the saliva. And in the salivary amylase means that when you eat starch, if you leave a piece of bread or something in your mouth, it starts to break down, it starts to taste a bit sweet, and that's because that amylase is breaking the starch down into its component sugars. Now, all mammals have amylase enzymes, but they normally have two genes for salivary amylase enzymes, and humans have a lot more, lot, lot, lot more variation. Two, we all have more than two, and we have as many as eight, nine, ten. It varies between populations, but the point is we have multiple copies of this gene, and if you have more copies of this gene, you produce more amylase, which means you're more efficient at digesting starch, and genetic work has shown that um, this uh, amylase copy number is strongly selected. That's that diagram below. It's a way that geneticists look at diversity in the genome. And the red bit is the this amylase copy number variation where it falls in the genome. And there's basically uh, almost no diversity. So that's an indicator that it's been strongly selected by natural selection, whereas all these other parts, uh, the adjacent parts of the chromosome, uh, there's lots of variation. Uh, and you can then use that to compare across species. So the interesting thing is we have ancient genomes now from Neanderthals, these ancient humans in Europe. They have two amylase genes 
no 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 evidence for more amylase genes that's also true of gorillas and chimpanzees and other uh, primate relatives so that selection has taken place since modern humans diverged from neanderthals and we can use genetic data to estimate that at about 450 a thousand years ago so that means for the last 400,000 years or so our ancestors have been adapted to and adapting to eating relatively high starch diets um, so that then brings us back to that question of how do you make that starch from plants accessible so some uh, some processing or cooking is necessary and that varies by plant and essentially you have two kind of early technological uh, approaches to dealing with this problem one is grinding pulverization and making flour. And we see very clear artifactual evidence for this in kind of Western Eurasia very early. So here's, here's examples of quirds and, and, and gravestones dating back to sort of 30,000 years or more uh, from places like Israel uh, and Lebanon. So this is an intensive way of processing plants, breaking those cell walls down, exposing the starch, uh, making flour. Now I would suggest that uh, boiling is a kind of alternative approach, but it won't work with all plants because of those differences in the cell wall. Uh, and as, I've, as I mentioned before, we get boiling in Eastern Asia, places like the Yangtze Basin in China, about 18 to 20,000 years ago are now the dates on the earliest uh, cooking pots. But if we stick with Western Eurasia, there's a whole series of sites, some of them shown here from, from, from Ukraine and Czech Republic and and Italy and Egypt and Northern Sudan and Israel and Lebanon and uh, uh, Iraq and uh, Iran and so forth, where we have grinding stones that are older than uh, 18,000 years ago. So back in our hunter-gatherer Pleistocene ancestry, and we even have uh, some preserved charred fragments of tubers that, are, uh, that have been processed. This is from a site in, in uh, Czech Republic there uh, with the SEMs at the right. So that shows us that people are actually cooking and processing these starchy roots and seeds uh, very, very early in this kind of broader region. And that contrasts with where we see early cooking pots. So here's some pictures of some of the earliest uh, cooking pots in Japan and southern China dating back to 18 to 20,000 years ago. And the map there is, a, is, an, is an attempt by some archaeologists, Peter Jordan and others, to model based on the earliest dates where we have archaeological dates for early ceramics where pottery is early. And you can see those dark kind of black colors on the map are in the Saharan region of Africa and in Eastern Asia. And the light yellow colors and orange colors are what you find in Europe uh, and Western Asia. Uh, and uh, you'll also see from this that most of India looks very late. They've left out some sites like Lahura Deva, which does have pottery about 9,000 years ago or something. But when, when this paper was published, that was, um, I think not taken into account. Uh, in any case, this shows that boiling is early. Now, the evidence from Eastern Asia suggests that early cooking pots, early boiling, was really focused not on plant foods, but on aquatic foods. Uh, and so in recent years, there's been, de been the development of lipid residue analysis, where you can extract the lipids that have kind of soaked into the ceramic fabric, and you can do a mass spectrometry on them and separate out the molecules uh, of the different fat components, and you can identify those through reference materials to the kinds of organisms they come from. You combine that with stable isotope analysis that separates things that come from the sea from things that live on land and so forth. And as you can see, you can see from these, this study here, looking at some stuff from the Amur River Basin and Southern China and Japan, that there's a dominance of marine organisms, marine fish in the lipid residues, some, some uh, percentage contribution from uh, land meats, and very, very little that looks like it comes from plants. So the development of ceramics in the East is probably focused on processing, boiling, and cooking these marine foods, and then it's later moved into uh, the use for plant foods later on. So that's different from the grinding technology in the West, which is very much developed about pulverizing plant foods. And we see that move towards uh, uh, plant foods at sites like Tenlo Shan. So this is a site that dates back about uh, 7,000 years ago in um, eastern China, so south of Shanghai. And there you can see the red dots on these, on these uh, uh, diagrams show that there's a kind of plant-dominated uh, component to those cooking residues as compared to contemporary and earlier pots from, in this case, Korea, which have this dominance of uh, fish lipids. Um, but what happens in Eastern Asia is, is pottery is in place, initially for fish and so forth, 
it then starts to be used for nuts and tubers and plant foods and it's at that period that agriculture develops in in eastern asia and we have two kind of agricultural systems that that, that develop in north china the yellow river basin we have millet domestication that's what we call foxtail and broom corn millet that, that come from that region and in the yangtze basin we have early rice farmers there's a different rice story from india which we can come back to later but this is your the subspecies japonica rices which are domesticated in this region and those essentially those crops are domesticated into or domesticated by cultures that already have a fairly elaborate boiling technology and you can see the, so some of the ceramics associated with these early centers which are these uh, tripod vessels for standing them over a fire so they can boil things and stackable the one in the middle is a pointed vessel so it can be full of full of boiling water and then it has a, a, a steamer, essentially a perforated bowl that fits in the top of that so you can steam things above uh, the boiled water. And these things are elaborated uh, very early on in the, uh, the in the Neolithic in Eastern Asia. By the time you get to develop Neolithic, uh, sort of uh, the, the Yangshao culture in central China, sort of uh, five, six thousand years ago, you have very elaborate typologies of vessels for steaming, boiling, uh, etc. But nothing for baking so that's that's your and that of course in a sense the whole chinese culinary tradition is based on that so as they move into the bronze age you get these bronze tripods uh, by which period you start to have writing so that we know that some of these are for simmering meats and meat sauces some of them are for heating wines and what they mean by wine is alcoholic beverages based on rice and millet uh, and you have drinking vessels to go with them and so forth and so there's a whole uh, development of uh, of culinary practices, which in a sense persist to the present day. So your kind of sticky japonica rices, your sticky rices, your rice and millet wines, whether it's Japanese sake or or, or Huangzhou in, in China, etc., are all based on this same sort of uh, technology. So then ways of eating and ways of consuming and cooking food that develop with that. So chopsticks, our earliest chopsticks go back to as you can see, more than 4,000 BC in the Lower Yangtze region, uh, made of bone in that case. So all this stuff kind of develops around that wider kind of set of cooking practices. Now we can contrast that with Western Asia. So as we talked about before in this area, so this map, we're looking at uh, the, the, the Middle East, or, or Iraq and Syria and Israel and Jordan and so forth. And those maps show the distribution, the modern distribution of wild barley at the top and wild wheat at the bottom. Now those uh, those uh, distributions have shifted a little bit because of climate change, but more or less they define what archaeologists refer to as the Fertile Crescent. And those numbered sites are archaeological sites that have contributed evidence for the domestication processes in these species. And I'm not going to go into the details of that, but roughly speaking, the domestication takes place between uh, sort of 11,000 years ago, so 9,000 BC and 7,000 BC, 9,000 years ago. So it's a kind of 2,000 year process a couple different species of wheat. In fact, four different species of wheat are domesticated, uh, none of which is modern bread wheat. That evolves later through hybridization uh, and, and barley is domesticated in this region. Also crops like lintel, masur, pea, uh, chickpea, chana, they also come from this uh, same uh, region and period. But what's interesting is when we look technologically, as I've already pointed out, this is the pre-pottery Neolithic. So PPNA in these charts is pre-pottery Neolithic A, and then the pre-pottery Neolithic B is divided into early, middle, and late. And only the late Neolithic is when you get ceramics. And so ceramics really start about 6,500 BC, but cultivation begins about 9,000 to 9,500 BC. So you have about 3,000 years of, uh, of, of cultivation and the domestication process of, of plants without any cooking pots. But what they do have is, is a very well-developed investment in grinding tools and grinding stones. And that's what this chart shows, that work by uh, Karen Wright, a senior colleague of mine, showing that through time from the Paleolithic through into the PPNA, PPNB, and late Neolithic, this is increase in the amount of sites that have ground stone tools. And this is from surface surveys and the percentage of the increase in querns for making flour, so fine grinding stone. And we see sites like this one here, Jerfalakmar, this is what's been called the kitchen at Jerfalakmar, this four-room building. You've got three grinding stones mixed to each other, kind of set into the wall, into a bench. Uh, 
Uh, and this is a site that has wheat and barley, but before they're domesticated, they're wild wheat and barley being ground into flour uh, routinely uh, on this site. The other thing that develops very early in this region are ovens. Our earliest kind of oven type features are, we might call them proto ovens. Uh, an early archeologist Braidwood called them enclosed hearths or baked in place basins, uh, where they basically have a clay wall around a sunken fire pit. Uh, and, and you can see my diagram at the top right. So it's an enclosed hearth. Those then develop into domed ovens, firin or, or tenur, uh, sorry, firin. And then tenors are the conical ones that develop out of them. Uh, and the, the photograph in the middle on the top right is actually from the site of Kalibangan. It's an early Harappan uh, tenor. And you've got some variation of archaeological firins and baked in place basins shown there. Um, but what, what, this, the, what this map shows is again, the distribution of wild wheat and barley and sites that are pre-agricultural or early agriculture that have early pit ovens and rimmed hearths. So the early ones are the sort of sunken pits or rimmed hearths, and this, these are again all pre-ceramic, so pre-cooking pot. Uh, and then uh, those develop into these early domed ovens. And, and again, this map shows in the blue triangle sites that have these early uh, domed ovens, these early fear and ovens, as some examples at the bottom. So one at Chatelhuyuk in Turkey, one at Jarmo uh, in Iraq, um, and a, a modern example uh, on the right. Um, but in any case, these are all these blue triangles are all places that have these ovens before they have pottery, before they have cooking pot. Um, and I had a, a student that's actually now, now uh, yeah, a student, uh, Laura Gonzalez Caratero, who did her PhD on early bread making. Uh, they're sampling one of these ovens in Turkey. Now, one of the things we wanted to, to get at, of course, okay, so we've got these archaeological features. We have ovens, we have these artifacts, grinding stones for making flour. Are they making flour? What are they doing with it? Are they making bread? That's in a sense of the question. Uh, and so what, we, what we've uh, started to do, and, and not just us, but a few labs of archaeobotany around Europe, really within the past decade, is start to study what we call amorphous charred fragments. And there's some photographs on the left. These are both from the site of Chatelhuyuk in Turkey. And these are uh, rather large pieces, but they're, they're kind of charred agglomerates of, uh, uh, of material. They include, uh, when we get under the microscope, they include fragments of plant tissue, but they are essentially processed foods. They're like burnt breadcrumbs that have fallen into the fire and been charred. Now, archaeobotanists like myself have focused for many years on extracting the charred seeds in archaeological sites to identify the plant species present, to say something about what people are eating and cultivating and how those crops are evolving. But we tended to ignore these amorphous charred fragments because, well, we frankly didn't know what they were. They were just lumps of charred stuff. So they went into the residue. So what we decided to do is really do a project on those with the idea that they might represent spillage during cooking, they might represent uh, charred foods. Uh, and, and so um, first, starting from the archeological material at Chattelhuyuk, we were able to look at these under scanning electron microscopy. Those are the pictures at the right uh, and define four different types of matrix. And this is looking at them in terms of their texture in terms of their porosity, in terms of particle size within them. Uh, we can define these four sort of types and they're kind of quantitatively different. And, and, then, we, and, and then we can compare those to experimental preparation. So we actually now have, we now know that the, the top type is like a dough. So it's like an uncooked ba a, a batter. The second type we think is a sourdough. So it's got those small uh, uh, air pockets because of some sort of bacterial fermentation. The third type is, is a bread type. This is a flat bread, an unleavened bread. And the fourth type is kind of a porridge type. And when we zoom in on those, you can see some of the components. So there's an example of wheat bran there in, in the middle left. The Descarinia is a kind of wild mustard seed. Sometimes you get uh, 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 cell layers from, from legumes like lentils and peas and so forth. So we were able to start to look at it quantitatively and identify which processes went into making these food lumps. And the, the, the key case study for uh, uh, Laura's PhD, uh, which she finished uh, about three years ago now, was the site of Chattelhuyuk, that's shown here. Now, one of the interesting things about the site, there were large excavations done in the 60s, and then there was a 25-year uh, excavation program from 1995 to, um, or 1993 to 2017, and I was involved in the last sort of five years of that, uh, is basically every house, pretty much every house, has an open hearth 
and a domed oven. Those are those little red things on the map there. Uh, and so it's clear that ovens, whatever they're for, are part of kind of routine daily practice. Uh, and our hypothesis is that, well, they're, they're, they look like, and they, they probably are, essentially firin, they're these domed bread-making ovens for uh, baking flatbread. Of course, you can do other things with them as well. And so here's one of these one of these houses. The yellow arrow shows the oven. Obviously, it's lost its top level. And then next to it is a little round hearth. So we sampled uh, plant samples from across the site, of course, Archimedes from all over the site, but we also particularly sampled these ovens. Uh, and we were able to, again, look at these uh, different types of matrix. These are all archaeological examples. So we have a dominance in the site of bread type matrices. Uh, and those breads are made of uh, wheat and barley, but they sometimes include uh, they sometimes include pulses, they sometimes include mustard, they sometimes include wild tubers, the sea club brush tuber that we were talking about earlier. So all those things are in the mix, uh, but this cereal based fine flours producing breads is the dominant uh, food type. We also do have evidence for porridge, and interestingly, the porridge increases in the upper levels of the site. So one of the things that's nice about Chattelhuyuk is when it's first occupied at 7,100 7, BC, it has no pottery. And you start to get your first pots and your kind of large, uh, first kind of significant cooking pot assemblages between 6,500 and 6,400 BC. So halfway through the occupation of the site and the site's abandoned around 6,000 BC. So those upper levels from 6,500 to 6,000 BC, you have cooking pots and not surprisingly, we get an increase in these porridge type matri matrices uh, over uh, in, in becoming more dominant over bread. And we can look at the components of, of plant material in them, and it's most it's mostly cereal tissues. It's mostly wheat and barley tissues. So that tells us that they're making bread back at the dawn of agriculture before they have cooking pots. Uh, we were then able to take the, that same technique and look at some uh, archaeobotanical samples from a site in Jordan, which is pr completely pre-agricultural, the site of Shubekia 1. Uh, this was being excavated by a Danish team. Uh, and... Um, the, you can, it has these kind of special stone built uh, buildings with sunken uh, pit ovens in the middle and in amongst the, the plant remains, which are all wild plants, including wild wheat, you have, again, uh, charred fragments of bread type preparation. So flat breads and those breads seem to be made out of wild wheat and wild sedge tubers. And so this can, you know, people ask first what came first domesticated crops or bread, well, bread came first. So we have a clear indication that the production of bread here precedes cultivation or the domestication of wheat uh, in this region. And as agriculture spread out of Western Asia into other areas like Southeastern Europe, ovens go with it. So these are examples of, of early Neolithic ovens from, uh, from the Balkans, from Serbia, from uh, Dikili Tash in Northern Greece uh, and the Tripolier culture uh, in, 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 in modern day Ukraine. Uh, and so you, th this kind of bread making technology spreads with agriculture out of that region. So uh, we, we've become quite interested in trying to track the spread of this technology, the spread of the oven. So red uh, arrow, red triangles show kind of Neolithic ovens as they spread out of, out of Southwest Asia into, uh, Mediterranean and in, in, in Southeastern Europe and eastwards, uh, basically as far as the Indus region. And then the orange triangles are later ovens, ovens that are kind of Bronze Age and later. So you see the, some of those moving into India as well as up, as well as up the Nile. Uh, but in any case, um, there is this, this, we often think about the spread of agriculture as spread of wheat and barley and sheep and goat. It's also the spread of cooking uh, technologies and in particular uh, baking ovens. And the, the ovens fizzle out as you move to Northwest Europe in the Neolithic. We have no ovens from France or Britain, for example, in the earliest farming society, so they move on to something else, in fact, cooking pots. And in fact, as we'll look at in a minute, there's very little evidence for ovens uh, in most of India. There's a little bit in the Harappan world, but not uh, not beyond that. So as we, we track this, this map of moving east, you get throughout the Iranian plateau, sites like Shangi Shukmak, which is in uh, northern Iran, sites like Jaitun in southern Turkmenistan, which right from the very beginning of their occupation have ovens. Sangi Shakmak is a nice one in that its early levels at 7,000 BC are pre-ceramic. Its later levels at like 6,000 BC have, have ceramics, but ovens are still a, a routine part of almost every house. 
Uh, this is also true of Marigar. And so those who know the history of ar archaeology in South Asia, Marigar is a very a, a significant site. It's got a very long sequence. It's in Baluchistan, in, in, in modern day Pakistan. And it runs from, it's occupied from something like 6000 BC or a little bit older in a pre-ceramic period. And then it has a transition to, to ceramics probably closer to 5000 BC. And then a sequence that leads up to the Har Harappan period. Um, before it's abandoned, it's abandoned around 2500 BC or something like that. Um, but the O's on this on this part of this plan are all these these fear in ovens in those early levels. So again, bread baking is part of that uh, early um, early process. Now this now there's no reason why one has to bake uh, wheat and barley. We associate wheat with certainly as, as Europeans we associate wheat with making bread in, in India you would associate wheat with making chapati or, or, or maybe naan if you're in the Northwest um, but you don't have to do it that way so when wheat also spreads into China in the at the end of the Neolithic around 4,000 years ago the earliest dates are about 2500 BC but it becomes more common after 2000 BC uh, it does not spread with ovens or with baking or with flatbread making tradition so when wheat gets to China, it gets, uh, in a sense, adapted to that boiling and steaming uh, trend, uh, traditions that are already established there. So, in a sense, wheat becomes, in terms of its cooking technology, cinified when it gets to China. It's turned into noodles. It's turned into to, to, to dumplings or buns that are steamed. Uh, it's not uh, made as bread. And so there's an interesting thing in which the spread of a crop uh, may spread with cooking technology, but it may also spread beyond its cooking traditions and get adapted uh, to local uh, culinary traditions. And that's now where we can move on to the sort of Indian part of this talk. And I'm going to focus on South India, but I'm going to start with this, uh, again, tr tracking the ovens uh, and what I would call the Eastern frontier of the early bread world. And that Eastern frontier is essentially in the Indus uh, uh, region. Uh, and so what this map shows, again, triangles are sites that have um, bread ovens. There's quite quite a few of them. For example, at Kalibangan, that's number eight there, uh, going back to the pre-urban uh, Harappan period. But in general, on Harappan sites, bread ovens are really quite rare. So Mahinjadara, which is the largest area ever excavated on a Harappan site, excavations going back to the 20s and 30s. Uh, as far as I as far as I'm aware, there's only a single bread oven that's been excavated in all that time, and that's in the courtyard in what uh, Mackay, the original excavator, called the palace. So a very big elite uh, household with, you know, 20 or 30 rooms and a big courtyard. So not your typical run of the mill family household. And they had a big bread oven, but your typical house did not. And so that tells us that something interesting is happening here. So wheat and barley have come from Western Asia, uh, but as they move into the Indus region, there are alternative ways of cooking that are in place. And so many people opt not to invest in bread ovens and not to make bread, presumably. Now, the, the, the alternative cooking system that one finds routinely in sites uh, in, uh, in Gujarat and Saurastra and in uh, Rajasthan, sites of the Ahar culture like Gulund, is of course chulhas. And so these are these sort of ha half circular clay stands that you can put a pot on top of to simmer for a long time. And in Harappan sites like Mahindradar and Harappa, you get a kind of version of the chulha with two piles of bricks. So those sites are mostly built of mud brick, right? So you get two piles of bricks over the hearth. So again, you can stand a cooking pot on the top. So that suggests to me that you have this uh, simmering tradition established in parts of Northwestern India and Pakistan uh, as during the period of the emergence of the Harappan civilization. And so alternative methods of cooking, simmering and so forth are in place that in a sense become dominant over bread as a, or are an alternative to bread. So it tells us that we're moving into a different uh, culinary world. This just shows that courtyard of that very large uh, palace building. Um, and the, the, the bit in gray is the, the large bread oven from Mahindradar, the only one. Um, now, in a, in a way this makes sense because when we look at South Asia and the Indian subcontinent from the point of view of where crops come from, so where the wild progenitors grow and where they first occur archaeologically and where we think they undergo domestication, there's a number of centers within uh, India uh, which are arguably local centers of, of crop domestication. 
And these are the kind of five classic centers that I def defined over a number of years, numbered there. Three, I'm not in, in the east, in the Orissa region, I'm not so sure that that's really a fully independent anymore. I mean, it looks like they're kind of getting stuff already domesticated, so coming from either the south or from the Ganges Plains, but certainly the Sarastra region, uh, the kind of western Himalayan kind of foothills in the northwest, and the southern Deccan and the, the middle Ganges are all regions that have crop domestication. So we have a lot of local diversity of millets domesticated in parts of the semi-arid parts of India, uh, indica-type rices from the Ganges, and that's a whole other lecture to do that to that, do that justice, as well as this diversity of pulses, your mung, erd, moth, uh, kulti, um, uh, tur, doll, these are all, of course, native to parts of India. All right, so we have a number of domestication centers, and that would be a whole other uh, story to, to, go through though, to, to go through that. The Neolithic chronology of South Asia is a little bit complicated, because, of course, different regions have their own sequences. And the, the, the precursor cultures, the hunter-gatherer cultures of the Mesolithic are really poorly documented. That's, of course, because these hunter-gatherer peoples are more mobile, so their sites are smaller, more ephemeral, harder to recover, harder to find. And then when those sites are reoccupied by Neolithic peoples later on, they tend to destroy a lot of the evidence of the early earlier hunter-gatherer culture. But what this, in a sense, shows is in the in the gray and the hatched areas is, is places where local domestication is likely or, or, or possible from local species. What you can see is in the Gangetic regions, the early Neolithic is based on rice, uh, and in the, in, the, in the south, so in the far right, uh, but also in, uh, this is also true of Saurastra, uh, it's, and parts of the northwest, it's based on, on local millets. And the yellow there is the arrival of wheat and barley. So we have a number of independent centers and, and, and different dates for the onset of pottery. So pottery is early in the Ganges Basin, places like Lahura Deva, the dates go back to between six and 7,000 BC. Uh, in, in the Deccan uh, and in Saurastra, it's like 3,000 BC, 3,500 BC. So it's a bit younger. Um, when we look at those early ceramics, it's clear that there's different pottery making traditions. So the techniques of making ceramics are different. So this just contrasts the the Mergar, early Mergar pottery, which again is added after after agriculture arrives, uh, the Middle Ganges pottery, which is slab built, paddle and anvil, and the so Southern Neolithic pottery, which is made with a coil method, where the clay is made into a kind of a snake and coiled around. So very different techniques of making early pot would suggest at least three uh, distinct origins of, of cooking pots in South Asia. That's a kind of minimum. Uh, and this is just a map uh, highlighting some of the indigenous millet diversity uh, in India. These are species like Semai and Sawa millet and Kodo millet uh, and brown top millet, Brachiarimosa, which seems to be the first staple crop of, of the South Deccan. So there's a number of different uh, millets domesticated in different parts of India. And again, that's a kind of a whole lecture in itself. What I want to focus on a little bit is, 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 think, is introduce you a little bit to and think through what we might know about cooking and changes in cooking in the South Deccan. So this area in red here, which is mostly northern northeastern Karnataka and adjacent bits of, of Telangana and, and Andhra Pradesh, um, which archaeologists tend to call the Southern Neolithic or the South Indian Neolithic or the Ash Mound tradition. Uh, and the Ash Mound is a particular kind of site that is uh, developed out of um, uh, cattle pinning sites with large mounds of burnt cattle dung. And this uh, archaeological tradition begins around 3000 BC. Now, this is actually where I did my PhD field research, and that's there's me doing some flotation uh, when I was a bit younger, um, just to give a sense of it. And, and, and so we have the spread of livestock, which are not domesticated locally, sheep, goat, and cattle. They spread through what I would call the Savannah Corridor, uh, and they meet up and they get adopted by local, let's say, hunter-gatherer, Traditions who then also cultivate uh, local species. This just shows one of these ash mounds, uh, which we know are, are pinning sites for cattle, sheep, and goat. Uh, and this is a plan of one. The, 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 large, the, the best excavated ash mound is, in fact, the site of Booty Hall, which was excavated by uh, archaeologists from Deccan College in Pune uh, in the 1990s, uh, where we have a couple of these penning sites and some huts and a butchery floor and, and various uh, evidence. Um, now, alongside these cattle pinning sites where they have these kind of ritual dung burnings, the ash mounds, you have 
hilltop village sites that become uh, start to be occupied about 2200 BC, 2200 to 2000 BC. And that includes sites like this one, Senganakalu or Sanarachima Hill, which is north of Bellary City, uh, and where we did quite a quite a lot of sampling in the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, working with uh, Ravi Korisetter from Karnatak University and a lot of archaeobotanical uh, work. Um, and so we were able to show from that and about a dozen other sites that we were able to sample in that period that we have a diversity of millets, but a dominance of the one in the top right there, Brachiaria ramosa, brown top millet, which is an almost extinct crop today, uh, but was the staple food uh, before you have the introduction of Chinese millets or African millets, which are things like sorghum, uh, jowar and, and bajra and ragi, finger millet, those all come from Africa later, and they displace some of these native millets. Uh, and uh, um, Navane, a uh, Chinese foxtail millet comes from China later too. So the, a lot of the dominant millets today are introduced and have taken over that kind of ecological niche of some of these native species. And then we also have a, 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 a very large quantity and diversity of pulses. So horse gram, pigeon pea, mung bean, and uh, hyacinth bean, uh, lab lab from these sites. Uh, so we're able to define a kind of native crop suite, all of which are potentially domesticated in southern India, not at Sanginakalu, but in the broader uh, uh, peninsula region. Um, and when they're domesticated, it's in a period where you have large, uh, as you can see, phase one here of the South Indian Neolithic, large cooking pots, large, large open cooking pots for boiling uh, and large serving bowls. So uh, they are presumably boiling, they may be steaming by wrapping things in leaves and so forth. In phase two, as you can see, you start to get your perforated vessels, which, which may be for straining and steaming um, coming in. And so that's uh, at around 2000 BC. And then, in and, and then you also start to get spouted vessels for doing interesting things with liquids. And in phase three, you also get these necked jars, which seem to be a technological diffusion from the Northwest. So on the left here, you've got kind of Harap a Harappan ceramic sequence, and you get Harappan related ceramics being adopted in the South only after 1800 BC, only in this phase three. So it tells us that we have a local cooking tradition which, which gets some innovation and elaboration with steaming, and then you get introduced pots from the north. Now that's also the tr true of the crop. So when we look at the dominant crops in the Indus Valley, it's wheat and barley, things that have come from Western Asia. These start to appear in the south only after 2000 BC, and at the same, roughly the same time that you start to see these necked jars. So that suggests that there could be a, a spread of both crops and some culinary traditions from the north. Now, I suggested when I wrote this stuff up a few years ago that this might be related to grain-based beers, things like wheat and barley spreading as, as, as beer products from the Northwest uh, and being added to an established Neolithic tradition. We also get a spread from south to north, at least from the South Deccan up to uh, Maharashtra and parts of, of southern Rajasthan of these spouted uh, pouring vessels. So there's some diffusion both ways. Um, now, a big change in cooking technology takes place in South India as we move into the Iron Age. So after 1000 BC or 800 BC, we get iron, uh, iron production, uh, you get a restructuring of society, you get hierarchy evidenced through things like megalithic burials, which are, you know, kind of have warrior elites buried in them with swords and weapons and so forth. We get a change in ceramics, we get specialization, so ceramics start to be real made and more standardized. They also get smaller. So you get kind of individual bowls and, and serving vessels, uh, and you get ones that are more open and flatter. And by the end, by about 500 BC or 400 BC, you start to get plates, tallies. You get your first tallies. And there's a whole other lecture on that. The tali uh, evolves in the, Gan in the Ganges Plains. So it's associated with early Indian rice culture in the north, and it's adopted in the south in that later, in that Iron Age period, actually around the same time that rice first occurs in South India. So rice comes from North India to the South, and so do tallies and plates for serving it. Um, but one of the interesting things that we can look at from some of these South Indian sites is the change in, uh, in vessel size. So these are just mouth diameter and height of, 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 of vessels. The black ones are early Neolithic, the open and the X's are Iron Age. You can see that they, they're, they're getting smaller over time. So there's a move away from these large 
cooking pots and kind of communal serving bowls towards personal bowls and plates. So that also tells us something about the social interaction in terms of cooking, where people are getting their own servings, uh, their own dishes, as opposed to perhaps sharing things more communally. So there's interesting changes that go with that. Um, now, South India is, of course, famous for a lot of its batter-based products. We could call them breads, but in some sense, that's a, that's a misnomer. They're not really breads. Um, and, and, and these are things that are, are griddle fried. These are things that are deep fried like water or idli that are steamed or your upamam or your, your various rice uh, type bread, rice type pancakes, perhaps is a better description uh, that I show here. And what, what, what's interesting about these is they also show us that it, as we saw in China, when wheat and barley get to China, they become adapted to local cooking traditions. When rice gets to South India, it gets adapted to local cooking traditions. So all of these things are essentially mixed, mostly mixed batters of a cereal that can be a millet, but it can, it's often rice today, but it presumably was millets originally, mixed with pulverized uh, pulse flours, uh, often herd today, but it can be any of the, the legumes, uh, mung bean, which is earlier in this region, pro probably features. Uh, and then those are usually um, sourdoughs, so they're fermented a little bit before they're, before they're steamed or boiled or uh, or, 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 or griddle made. And so that suggests to me that the, these kind of cooking traditions are already in place in the Neolithic based on millet and pulse flowers and rice is being eventually adapted to them. Now, our next challenge is to, is to ask, what is the archeological evidence for this? It's a nice hypothesis that we have this kind of local Neolithic domestication and a development of a distinctive ways of preparing cereal based things. So again, we need to start to do exactly the kind of work I described from a uh, Chattelhuyuk in Turkey, which is looked for these charred amorphous food lumps. Uh, and uh, the first study of these has come out. It was published earlier this year by uh, Jennifer Bates, who's uh, actually did, was a master's student of mine, did a PhD in Cambridge, and then was a postdoc at University of Pennsylvania with Kathleen Morse. And this is from an Iron Age site, uh, uh, Kabale, that they um, that Kathleen Morrison was involved in excavating and in amongst the other plant remains of flotation samples, there are these amorphous lumps. And this is very much just a preliminary study of a few of these where they, in a sense, are pointing out the presence of these. You have, a, and by comparing it to the reference material we have from Western Asia, which is very imperfect, uh, you have a, 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 a flatbread type matrix, which includes millet husks, so brachiarimosa husks, so that's a native millet flatbread. But then you have a more porous pulse-based matrix which I would suggest looks more like a, one of these sort of batters, so it's the kind of batter before you would make a, 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 a water or an idli or something. Uh, and it's got fragments of, of, of pulse alurone in it. From pulse alurone, it's very often very difficult to get it to species, but some sort of pulse. Uh, so the potential to do exactly this kind of work is, is certainly present in South India. Uh, and so we're now in the sort of exciting stage of we need to get more ethnographic samples. We need to do more experimental work to produce analogs for these, and we need to pull more of this material out of flotation samples. So 25 years ago when I was doing flotation for my PhD and I was identifying the millets and pulses, we also had this sort of material uh, from South Indian sites, but at that time we didn't really have the the methods or the really language to describe or study this material. So now is the chance to go back uh, and do that. And so we really need more uh, analog work. This means ethnoarchaeological studies with traditional food processing and uh, and and using that to develop reference materials and then doing experimental ones where we experimentally char it so that we can look at it under high magnification under scanning electron microscopy and work out how to tell the difference between uh, something that's fermented versus not something that's boiled versus steamed versus fried uh, versus griddled uh, and what difference it makes whether we substitute rice for millet or various pulse species. So we're very much at the very beginning stages of actually starting a kind of archaeobotany of processing and cooking uh, in uh, South Asia. And as I say, over the past 10 years, this has really started to develop in European context and European archaeological sites. Now it's time to develop it in, in India. I just wanted to briefly touch on one other aspect of variation that in a sense parallels that parallels the cooking variation that I've talked about across Eurasia. And this is the production of alcohol. So fermentation to produce alcohol is, of course, another thing that is 
uh, I suppose, characteristically human. Most hu human uh, cultures have some production and consumption of alcoholic um, uh, uh, beverages. Uh, and of course, alcohol is about converting sugar to alcohol through fermentation organisms. But we very often start not from sugar, but from starch, and that creates uh, uh, you know, a certain paradox. So uh, starch does not convert directly to alcohol. So you need to convert the starch first to sugar. And there's essentially uh, three, uh, th three variants of this. One, you find something that's naturally full of sugar. So a fruit or a honey or a palm sap. Those are things, so that's like grapes in Western Asia or your palm toddy in, in Tamil Nadu. Those are things that are naturally uh, full of sugar. They naturally ferment. So that's in a sense, the easiest. Uh, that, and that's presumably the first sources. But what's interesting is when we have uh, al um, starch-based cuisines, how do you convert starch to sugar? And so there's, there's essentially there's, there's kind of um, uh, three methods. So that's under B here. You can either use uh, uh, human salivary amylase, which we've talked about. So that means you chew things up, add human saliva, then you, you chew them up and then spit them out. And the amylase in the saliva actually breaks starch down into sugar. And we find this uh, traditionally around the world in South America and parts of Africa and parts of Northeast India. We, it tends to be a little bit less common now, perhaps. We may see it as, as kind of somehow less clean, but that's a very common way to chew up something that's starchy, add human saliva, let it sit. That, that allows the amylase enzymes from the saliva to break down the starch into sugar. So that's one approach, which of course is potentially universal. There's humans with saliva everywhere. But what I'm interested in is the differences between two, B2 and B3. So plants themselves produce amylase when they germinate. So if you germinate a grain, as it germinates, it creates amylase enzymes, that germination process. Those amylase enzymes will then start breaking the starch down into sugar. That's of course how the plant feeds its seedling. So the seed feeds a seedling through converting that starch in the seed into sugar. Uh, and when we use it for alcohol production, we call it malting. So, you know, traditional beers in Europe, you take barley, you germinate the barley, it produces amylase, then you roast the barley to kill those seedlings, but the amylase chemical is in there. Then you grind it down to flour and that, that, that malted flour, malted powder, that's full of amylase enzymes. You then mix that with more uh, cereal and water, whether it's barley or, or wheat or maize or whatever, uh, and then that the the amylase from that malted powder from those germinated barley grains will break the starch down into sugar, and then you can add yeast to ferment it. So that's kind of conventional Western uh, beer. But another way is to use amylase from fungal sources. Uh, so some fungi produce amylase that breaks down uh, starch into sugar, and we would call these ferment starters. Uh, and then, of course, converting sugar into alcohol uh, requires yeast, and it's almost always the same species of yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So the reason B2 and B3 are interesting is they also have a, a, a geographical patterning. So the area in red there that I've highlighted, 3C, and this is from a, a, a Japanese anthropologist, Takako. Um, anyways, 3C is the area that he, that he maps and identifies as the mold fermented beverage zone, which is mostly Eastern Asia. Southeast Asia and northeastern Im India and parts of the Himalayas. And these are areas where you, you, you're you using a, uh, a fungal starter. So in a sense, you cook your rice or your millet, you let it go moldy, and that mold then breaks, uh, creates amylase enzymes. You then use that to mix with, with more starchy liquid to uh, break the sugar down into starch. This is, uh, of course, you know, industrially done today in places like Japan, where they produce sake, rice wine, um, and it's what they call koji. But of course, those kojis are, those mold ferment starters are carefully cultured. So each sake factory has its own stash of this fungus, and it's passed down. So in a sense, you have domesticated funguses for saccharification. And then in, in the West, the area in, in blue is malt fermented. Uh, but I would suggest that maybe in Eastern Asia, the malt fermented beer making systems are a colonial introduction from the West. Uh, and we, but we know they go back very early in, in Western Asia. Um, I would suggest that there might be a kind of pre-colonial uh, Eastern limit of, of routine malting somewhere around the Indus Valley. Um, no, so what's happening in South Asia? Well, in South Asia, you have so many naturally sweet 
things that you don't need to bother with turning grain into uh, into sugar, into alcohol, because of course you have palm sources, you have flower nectars like mahua, you have all kinds of fruits. So I would suggest that a lot of the indigenous, uh, and of course you have honey, and so a lot of the indigenous alcohol traditions in India probably are based on these, and so it kind of forms a, a barrier between the malting traditions of Western uh, Asia and Europe and the Mediterranean and the, the ferment starters of, of the East. So this again just kind of illustrates these different forms of sacrification. Uh, let's not go into the different kinds of starts, that's complicated. Uh, and I would suggest that the archaeological, pictorial, and in some cases linguistic evidence points to this division. So we know that malted beers are very early uh, in, in, Western, in Western Asia and Mesopotamia and Egypt, and we have written sources and some archaeological evidence for those. I would suggest that the kind of historical linguistics of Terms in the in the Dravidian languages points to an importance of of honey, mahua flowers, palm toddy, uh, and honey wines going back uh, quite early uh, in 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 the past, going back into the past, probably even to the Neolithic. Uh, and then in Eastern Asia, uh, we have this uh, mold ferment starters. What this uh, diagram shows is a phylogeny of yeast. This is the yeast that turns sugar into alcohol. And it shows that we have a Western, a European wine yeast cluster and an Eastern rice wine, Chinese rice wine and sake cluster, indicating that these yeasts have really uh, been evolved separately. So they've kind of parallel evolution of alcohol fermentation traditions. What's interesting about the European one is when you zoom in on it, European bread, bread ra raising yeasts and beer yeasts, they all derive from the wine yeast. So wine comes first, then beer and uh, yeast leavened bread in in the west um so a little bit more about ferment starters because there's again an interesting kind of uh, ethnography and archaeology to be done on these and this is from some work by uh, japanese anthropologists in cambodia uh, showing the creation of these things so you it, it, what this shows is the whole process so they've boiled up some uh, rice um, pulverized rice being mixed there then it's made into these little cakes these cakes, then at C4, they're sprinkling powders of previous cakes over them to introduce the mold. Uh, so again, it's a cultured mold. And then those cakes go moldy. And that, that creates this Aspergillus oryzii is, is the predominant fungus. But you also get other things like Rhizopsis oryzii and a number of other species. But it's predominantly Aspergillus. Uh, and then that, that uh, this is dried. Once it produces some amylase enzymes, it's dried. And then those dry um, balls that you see at the bottom can be stored dry and then they're broken up when it's time to make some rice or millet wine. Um, and what's interesting is these ferment starters include both the yeast and the fungal organisms. And the fungal organisms are domesticated. So Aspergillus is one of our Aspergillus flavus, which is the ancestral Aspergillus is actually a major source of food poisoning. It's why you can't eat cold rice too many days after you've cooked it because it, it, it is it, it produces toxins but aspergillus oryzii is a kind of domesticated form of that that's lost the genes for producing those toxins so sometime in the neolithic this evolved somewhere in eastern asia and so we have these cultured versions of it uh, that are non-toxic or less toxic that are then used as, as sacrifying uh, organisms uh, and there's and there's interesting that there's lots of traditions of this around Southeast Asia and Northeastern India. So there's been recent studies of, uh, of uh, ferment starters from Meghalaya and the Aham people in Assam, um, looking at really the kind of consortium of microorganisms. So in, 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 in a lot of these areas, the consortium of microorganisms are not the uh, Aspergillus oryzii that we get in East Asia, but other others, as you can see, some of the list of them here. So there's a lot of interesting work to be done to understand the number of versions of this kind of tradition of making alcohol. There's a huge diversity of it uh, actually amongst these uh, various traditional peoples in northeastern India and doubtless in Myanmar and other parts of Southeast Asia um, waiting to be studied. And then, of course, that's the first step to, again, asking what does this stuff look like if it is charred and survives archaeologically? How would we separate this from those breads and porridges we were looking at before? So can we start to find evidence for this uh, and in terms of uh, you know beer making traditions within south asia you'll see these through especially through the himalayan belt and things like 
and then Paul Tongba, etc. Uh, and then, of course, there's a whole diversity of these in East Asia. So the whole system of fermenting tofu and soy sauce and fish sauce is actually all based, developed out of this same ferment starter that started from rice or millet. So, I'm so just Professor Fuller, uh, yeah, I'm just going to yeah. conclude. Uh, this is my last slide. Um, my basic conclusion is that traditions of cooking are very long lasting and they proceed, in most cases, they precede agriculture or they go back right to the beginnings of agriculture. And these established traditions uh, within which technologies of cooking and food preparation evolve, in a sense, we can define kind of macro regional zones uh, of civilization and to, of culinary civilization. Um, and I suggest that they are part of, you know, they partly answer the question why cultivate certain species in certain regions, because they fit into those processing conditions. Why adopt some species and not adopt others, because they fit into those processing traditions. Uh, but of course, where cultures interact, you have the potential to borrow and exchange. And so this is a whole milieu of study in which we can really look at both the longevity of cultural traditions and how they innovate over time, but then also how they adapt and adopt uh, and interact. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Sorry for running a bit long. Uh, Okay, so that's that's all I have to say. Uh, 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 thank you, Professor Fuller, for the uh, wonderful knowledge sharing and highlighting the many hidden facts about early Indian cooking. It was indeed interesting. We have a few questions uh, from the audience. So, Professor Kuntel. Um, good afternoon, sir. Um, well, I'm by training, I'm an industrial designer. So I'm a bit interested in making and the skills of making and how it evolved with agriculture. So, uh, you know, I, I do not know how to pose this question and it may get a little longer, but do we have an industrial revolution parallel of making as far as agriculture is concerned because i see there is a connection i mean we were making things but uh, agriculture brought us new challenges of making storage maybe we have scaled up so do we see um, like a boom in the making skills or the craft skills with agriculture uh, or yes uh, yeah, yes ab absolutely i mean you know agriculture is is you know, on the one level, agriculture is about growing plants and raising animals and making food. But to do that successfully, it requires a whole kind of technology around it and techniques. Uh, and agriculture also allows for people to usually stay place, stay put year round. So sedentary communities, larger population densities, and it allows you then to support, in a sense, as a kind of snowball effect, it, it supports um, you know, you can produce a surplus of food and support people who then become specialized craftsmen. So the origins of agriculture around the world is associated with with a kind of technological boom. And that can be the development of ceramics or grinding tools and ovens and architectural developments. Uh, it also, you know, it's the first period when we get evidence for spinning to make textiles also. Uh, and so there's a whole, you know, there's a whole, there is a technology of how do you live year round? How do you store? How do you cook? Uh, how do you clothe yourself? On all of that changes with uh, the development of agriculture. And what I find fascinating is in different parts of the world, those technologies and techniques that come together are slightly different. So as we see, ceramics are early in the East and late in the West, but ovens are early in the in the West. Uh, and and and, uh, and and you know, so we can kind of characterize each of these Neolithic as not just about the origins of agriculture, but also about a kind of nexus of craft, uh, specialization, and sort of technological developments. We also tend to see a lot more uh, uh, the kind of symbolic culture. So of course, you know, we have famous Paleolithic cave paintings here and there, but in the Neolithic, you get a lot more evidence for art, whether it's figurines, painted pottery, uh, rock art in South India. So there's also more investment in what we might think of as the arts in the Neolithic, because you have more time for and more people living together to experiment and specialize in these things. Mm 
Uh, you're muted. Yeah. Oh, no, there you go. Yeah. Yes, yes, please. Okay. Yeah. My question is, when we started agriculture, 9000 uh, BC, you said, right? And we started cooking. Almost we took 3000 years to start having vessels. So what were we doing with that grain which we were producing? That's my first question. And my second question is, how did this uh, uh, batter get preserved? What you initially showed those SEM pictures of yeah, the batter, yeah. fermented batter and other things. I mean, it's something which is very degradable. How did you preserve yeah, so that? I, I mean, how did I'll start with, I'll start with the last, I'll start with your second question. So it's charred, it's carbonized. So most of our plant remains, of course, if you drop a seed in the soil, you drop rice on the floor, it will decompose, insects and fungus will eat it. So if you, but if you drop it in your fire or your hearth it, and it only gets partly charred, it becomes carbon uh, and then it's inert, then fungus won't attack it, then it won't decompose. So what we're looking for archeologically are those charred plant remains. And of course, uh, luckily, in a sense, humans use a lot of fire, and so we have hearths and ovens, and people are burning wood, but they're dropping st other stuff in the fire, whether it's crop processing waste, whether it's sweeping from the floor, whether it's spillage when they're cooking, stuff gets charred, and once it's charred, it doesn't decompose, and we can recover that after uh, many thousands of years. So the, the kind of bread and butter of archaeobotany is charred grains, charred rice grains, charred wheat grains, and those cereal grains are hard and dry, so they survive charring quite well, and we can identify them as species. But what we find is we also get these little, uh, in a sense, crumbs. You can think of them as bread crumbs or drops of batter that have fallen into the fire and then charred. And once they're charred, uh, they can survive. And so we can recover them, even if in small quantities, we can recover them. So it's all preserved by charring. Um, and and that's uh, that's what we have to work with. I mean, there's a few parts of the world like the it, tombs in ancient Egypt, which are in the desert, where you will get dry bread loaves and things. But those are extremely rare contexts. For most of the world, plant remains are preserved by charring. Uh, so your first question is, is how are we cooking foods before vessels? Well, as I tried to outline, it depends on where you are. So in Western Asia, so this is, you know, Syria, Turkey and so forth. Um, pottery comes after agriculture. So the early uh, processing is by grinding and by making uh, flatbreads and, and by developing ovens and meat is presumably roast, you know, kind of barbecued. In Eastern Asia and China, pottery precedes agriculture. So they already have cooking pots that hunter gatherers are using to cook acorns and shellfish and fish and things. And so when you get rice and millet domesticated there, they start boiling it. Within India, uh, I would say you have, a, 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 again, at least three d really distinctive zones. So in 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 north in the Ganges plains in in, in North India, uh, uh, we don't have that many sites that are early, but it's it's clear from sites like Chopani Mondo, where pottery dates back about 4,000 BC, and Lahura Deva, where it goes back sort of six seven thousand BC, that we have cooking pots early. So I would suggest that the Ganges region has some cultures, not all of them, because we also have hunter gatherers at 2500 BC with no pots who are still hunting and gathering but th some of their neighboring cultures have pots uh, and then develop agriculture so in, in the north sort of early Indian rice is boiled in pots because pottery is earlier probably than domestication in the Ganges in, in Pakistan and Baluchistan uh, uh, wheat and barley spread from Western Asia and they spread without pottery. They spread with ovens, but no pottery, and pottery develops later. So again, they start with a kind of bread, an aceramic bread tradition. Uh, in, in South India, we seem to have a pretty close association between the period of domestication of millets and pulses and the development of ceramics. Now that may be, partly be we don't have enough archeology span of the earliest phases there. So early pottery and cultivation we think is around 3000 BC. And so those kind of co-evolve, I would say. And they co-evolve probably uh, for boiling and steaming and making these sorts of, uh, of, of mixed pulse and millet batters uh, that we've been talking about. But at this stage, that's a hypothesis. We need to go back uh, to the field and get more samples to, to study that. So it's a slightly different uh, trajectory in different regions. So uh, thank you very much for the elaborated answers and all. We are like uh, taking only a few questions due to the lack of time. 
Yeah. So thank you very much again, Professor uh, Kuler. Yeah. So uh, we have next session. Uh, sorry, Professor uh, Wagler, for the delay. I mean, uh, I think uh, you understand us. Uh, yeah. So for the third talk, we have Professor Ganesh Wagler. Professor Ganesh Wagler is known for the pioneering research in computational uh, gastronomy, the emerging data science that blends food with artificial intelligence. Trailblazing research from his lab has established foundations uh, in the niche area that deals with food, uh, flavors, nutrition, and health. Professor Bagler has an audacious dream of transforming the global food landscape through data-driven innovations. Again, uh, to know more about his research and him, I believe we need to go to the library and I need to spend more hours to read about his research and all. Yeah, so today he will talk about uh, computational gastronomy, a data-driven approach to food. Yeah, uh, please, uh, over to you, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Just allow me a second before I can share uh, my screen. Uh, I hope the slides are available to you. Please, can you please confirm? Yeah. Good. I, yes, I, I can see. Yeah, I can see that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I'm Ganesh Bagler. Uh, I would like to, at the outset, thank uh, DYPIU, Professor Prabhat uh, Ranjan, Professor Shashi Singh, and uh, Professor Sanjay Kumar for invitation and facilitating. Uh, this presentation, this webinar. Uh, I know there is nothing more challenging than talking about food to a hungry audience. So I promise to keep it short while providing the gist of uh, what I intend to impress upon you. And that is about how computers and computer science can be of immense value in transforming food and cooking the way we see it. That is the premise of uh, my talk. I'll be telling you about a new domain, a new niche called computational gastronomy and how a data-driven approach to food can illuminate different aspects of cooking, food, and cuisines. Well, that is the premise with which I'll be presenting. Let's, so let me take it forward. So I am Ganesh Bagler. I'm affiliated with Infosys Center for Artificial Intelligence as well as the Department of Computational Biology at IIIT Delhi. And if you were to think that I am uh, somebody who has been looking at food right from the beginning, then there would be nothing wrong. Uh, there would be absolutely wrong. I, as a teenager, was an aspiring astronomer. And only over the time I have been looking at food and have moved from astronomy to gastronomy. And this is my trajectory. I have, uh, in fact, trained. I have been trained in physics at none other than uh, University of Pune Physics Department. After which, I have moved on for a degree in computer science and uh, computational uh, biology at CCMB, and a long journey after that in computational biology before coming down and looking at food from a computational perspective. My lab, the Complex Systems Laboratory, looks at a variety of complex systems primarily coming from biological origin and investigates a phenomena of emergence in many of these, including that of food. We have already been apprised about food and cooking in a very wonderful manner by Ashok as well as Professor Fuller. Uh, and so the background has been set in what I would like to present. And I would like to impress upon the fact that cooking is always often seen as a magical process of transforming raw ingredients into delicious dish dishes that we are used to consuming on a day-to-day -day basis. Having said that, a variety of cultures across the world have come up with idiosyncratic ways of putting together ingredients, processing them, and consuming them. And that's what we know as cuisines from different parts of the world. 
and it turns out that cooking is central to the evolution of disproportionately large brain sizes that we tend to have and incidentally it has been argued that because we had this ability of cooking and processing raw ingredients we could get enough time from hunting and gathering so as to invest on increasing the brain size which has been critical for developing the critical thinking and creative abilities that we have and this is the argument which professor fuller also uh, touched upon that richard ranga makes in his book called catching fire how cooking made us human that cooking is the very essence of being human no other species on earth knows how to cook and process food the way human uh, being does in a in a very uh, specialized manner in a very nuanced manner and despite the fact that food and cooking are so central to our existence on the earth turns out that we have evolved from a primitive species to what we are today one of the most dominant species on the earth we have also been plagued with the lifestyle disorders such as obesity cardiovascular disorders and type 2 diabetes which seem to be becoming one of the most predominant type of disorders present on the earth uh, on uh, on plaguing human beings and if you were to probe down trying to find out what are the factors that have contributed towards this lifestyle disorders then turns out that among other factors such as genetics so uh, the so social factors as well as the uh, uh, sedentary lifestyles that we tend to have one of the most critical factor is nothing but our diet what we tend to consume on a day to day basis and on top of it i would like to present the fact that by 2050 we will be presented with a challenge of feeding 10 billion people and that is something which can, which we can address only if we were to use the 21st century technology and that of computer science and data science in trying to look at food from a data driven perspective only then we shall be able to come up with ways by which we can transform food in a dramatic fashion and feed 10 billion people and that is the premise with which i'll be talking about data is extremely critical and central to the world today in 21st century and having said that how can we make food computable is the question that we have been asking in my lab now you might wonder how is it that food that is something very very emotional and personal can be converted into a data science if that is what you are thinking about then yes that is the story i'm going to present you today about how food can be converted into a data science when we think about food we think of the traditional recipes which have been passed on from generations by oral renditions and over the time by written records and of course the flavors the taste and the odor that we experience when we uh, eat and bite into any given ingredient or consume any given ingredient and a- a- apart from that of course the nutritional aspect of the food which is what is something very critical towards uh, you know driving the health related factors uh, of food so all of these are critical components when we think about food and when we started working on food in uh, we started looking at each of this aspect from a data perspective we wanted to gather data of food in each of the from each of these perspective and thereby apply analytical techniques computational methods for coming up with interesting analysis of cuisines of food nutrition and also health related implications so what is computational gastronomy it's a data science which blends food with data and the power of computation so as to achieve data driven food innovations and i'll be telling you about what are these different innovations as i go along but before that let me touch base with some of the research that we conducted roughly 7 years back when i was still an assistant professor at uh, iit jodhpur and that is when we started looking at 
India, Indian cuisines and the diversity that is present in the Indian cuisines from a data driven perspective. Given the fact that India is extremely diverse in its dietary practices, culinary practices and culturally rich, as well as got a history of health centric dietary practices, we wanted to put together a resource of Indian food and Indian recipes. And that's when we landed upon various data resources, including Tarla Dalal, from where we compiled a large number of recipes. We had to begin with 2,543 recipes coming from the website of Tarla Dalal, which have basis in a variety of Indian cuisines coming from length and breadth of the Indian subcontinent, such as the Bengali, Gujarati, Jain, Maharashtrian, Mughlai, Punjabi, Rajasthani, and South Indian cuisines. We broke down these recipe into recipes into their constituent ingredients. And each of these ingredients belong to a distinct category, such as vegetables, spices, pulse, dairy, cereals, beverages, etc. Having got these data of recipes, their ingredients and the ingredient categories, the next thing that we wanted to figure out was what is the scientific basis because of which we choose to ignore or use certain ingredient and ingredient combinations in the recipes that have been traditionally passed on. And one of the primary reason why we in, used to, used to uh, choose certain ingredients in the recipes is by virtue of the taste and odor that we perceive. And this taste and odor is nothing but primarily coming because of the flavor molecules that are present in the ingredients, which is what is interacting with our olfactory and gustatory mechanisms, giving rise to a rich sense of flavor, fragrance, and aroma of the ingredients. We collected the flavor molecules data that is present in all of these ingredients that go into the recipes. And we used a variety of online as well as offline resources to compile these data. Having compiled this tripartite data of information of recipes, ingredients, and the flavor composition, flavor profiles, of these ingredients, now the recipes themselves become quantifiable. We could go ahead and measure something called the food pairing. Food pairing tells us nothing but a given recipe, what are the kind of ingredients that are going into it and further, what kind of ingredient combinations typically tend to go well with each other. And this is the proposition that was given by a chef called Heston Blumenthal, who proposed that indeed we tend to have recipes that have ingredient combinations that tend to have similarities in terms of their flavor, the taste and odor of these ingredients. We wanted to check this proposition in the context of Indian cuisine and therefore we went ahead, quantified food pairing the way I suggested to you and measured it across the Indian recipes. And what we found was that the food pairing index that is computed using these 2,543 recipes from across the Indian, uh, Indian uh, sub, uh, uh, regional cuisines have a certain number, which is nothing but average number of shared flavor molecules across all pair of ingredients in a given recipe, which is averaged over all the recipes. Well, we did one more interesting experiment. We wanted to find out what is the ingredient category, if there is any, which might be the key contributor towards the observed food pairing in the Indian recipes. And for that, we went ahead and randomized the ingredients within a given category to see if placement of a given ingredient category is rather sensitive for deciding the food pairing index that we had measured in the Indian recipes. And we found out that, well, any of the food category, ingredient category, such as vegetables, dairy, and uh, fruits, etc., if you were to shuffle them, keeping everything else in its own place, the food pairing index gets only marginally disturbed, except for one category. And you may want to guess it already, given 
the exposition of Indian cuisine and the kind of ingredient that seem to be rather critical in Indian cuisine by uh, Ashok. And turns out that yes, it is none other than spices, the spice category of ingredient, which are rather critically placed in the Indian recipes. By that we mean that if you were to use a spice which is of uh, a different spice as opposed to a particular spice which is recommended for a recipe, then the food pairing index itself will get disturbed, will get uh, will, will be affected dramatically. And that is what is shown here in the picture that the original food pairing index is getting severely affected and becoming what it is as shown uh, by the spice uh, variation in the spices. So spices are extremely critical. The placement of spices is extremely critical in the Indian recipes is what we ended up observing. And we also found out that as opposed to ingredients being put together randomly, absolutely randomly, which is what I call as a monkey cuisine, the Indian cuisine, as opposed to that of a Western cuisine, which tend to have the so-called uniform food pairing, ingredients of similar flavor being put together in a given recipe, has a contrasting pattern, a pattern of ingredients of disparate type, disparate ingredient types being put together to create a contrasting flavor blend in a typical recipe that is found from an Indian subcontinent. Both of these reports are available online. You might want to read up and convince yourself that Indian cuisine is indeed rather unique in terms of the contrasting food pairing pattern, which is, uh, which is not found in typical Western cuisines, which by that I'm referring to the North American, Latin American, Southern and Eastern European cuisines. And that ended up becoming one of the major statements that coming out of our research, highlighting the uniqueness of Indian recipes across regional cuisines, I may say. And also highlighting the fact that spice is the most critical contributor towards the taste of Indian recipes. And that's how we proclaimed by making the spoof on one of these Indian brands to say that the spice is the taste of India. This research led us towards finding out the culinary fingerprints of regional cuisines of India. And like shown here, we could find out what is the uniqueness of the South Indian cuisines, for example, South Indian recipes vis-a-vis the Maharashtrian or a Bengali recipe for that matter. And that we named as culinary fingerprint, which uniquely tries to identify in a data centric fashion, the uniqueness of individual regional cuisines. This research, when we did way back in 2015, ended up being one of the most interesting piece of research, which was touted as emerging technology by none other than MIT technology review and highlighted is it as the best of 2015 by the end of year 2015. It has got a lot of press coverage and has been highlighted by uh, people like V. Sangvi, who is a, a culinary writer who writes a root food column in Hindustan Times, by Hindu and a large number of magazines across uh, the world. Among them was a chef uh, Garima Arora, one of the first Indian origin women chef uh, who, uh, uh, who, who has talked about and how you, uh, our research is kind of useful for uh, trying to uh, find a new combination of ingredients which can be used for innovating recipes. And this research was also in Chemistry World, the Royal Society of Chemistry magazine, which, which was titled as the Kareem Flavor uh, uh, article that highlighted the role of spices in Indian cuisine. Importantly, we found that industry was not far behind in recognizing the fact that blending food with data and computation is going to be the next frontier of science and was touted as the sweet spot of the food. Having told you this historical fact about how we have been able to look at food from a data driven perspective to find out the uh, culinary fingerprints of various Indian regional cuisines. Now I would like to tell you about the futuristic perspective about, about where computational gastronomy is taking us, thereby 
helping us making food computable making different aspects of food computable thereby invoking the paradigm of computer science for analyzing different aspects of food and importantly then invoking the paradigm of artificial intelligence for innovation in food going beyond the human intelligence how computers can help us to innovate in different aspect of food is what i'm going to touch upon now i'll be telling you about the recipe space the innovations that can be done by looking at recipes also by looking at the molecular space in terms of the flavor molecules and finally talking about the nutrition and health aspect of food so no science can be converted into a data science in the absence of structured data repositories pertaining to food and we noticed way back that indeed there is a dearth of structured data repositories when it comes to food and that is where we took upon this job in my lab of putting together data repositories of recipes from across the globe and this is already now published in database journal from oxford university press called recipe db available in an online format which can be used for exploration for any by anybody who in, who is interested in food and recipes and this uh, repertoire has more than 116000 recipes from across the globe pertaining to 26 world regions as well as 84 countries not to mention that we also provide the estimated nutritional profile of these recipes in terms of macro as well as micronutrients that are present in these recipes going beyond we also created the global standard for flavor molecules in ingredients that are used in the recipes and have created this flavor db database which is published in nucleic acid research wherein we provide a repository of flavor molecules which are present in different ingredients and various mechanisms by which you can explore the flavor space and even find the pairings of ingredients by which we can tell you which ingredients are more common or dissimilar in terms of their flavor profile so going beyond the exploration that we had done of indian cuisine we have now created the data of culinary fingerprints of world cuisines coming from a variety of uh, cultural backgrounds and geographical diversities and this particular paper talking about the culinary fingerprints of the world cuisines was given the best paper award in none other than IEEE International Conference on Data Engineering which was uh, presented at Paris and this is something which is going to help us identifying the idiosyncratic patterns present in different parts of the world different cuisines in the world thereby enabling food uh, and beverages companies to come up with interesting innovations in foods and uh, and beverages going beyond we also asked a question about is it possible for us to build the tree of world cuisines similar to that of world languages which can tell us about how different cuisines are interrelated to each other in terms of their culinary patterns in terms of the kind of ingredients that are used far more frequently together than other cuisines and this is how we ended up coming up with the first culinary tree which is still under experiment and we are trying to play with it to make it more refined but it does give us an interesting picture of geocultural similarities in different cuisines telling us about which cuisine are whether very similar in terms of ingredient combinations and which are dissimilar to each other and as an extension of this research we wanted to ask this question about given the fact that there are approximately a thousand type of ingredients actually the number is in around 20000 if you were to look at different variations of potatoes and tomatoes and chilies and similar kind of ingredients however even if you were to do a coarse graining and put them under single basket of a potato and the uh, a tomato for example we can still have a large number of combinations of ingredients with which recipes can be generated and the number of recipes that can be thus synthesized using permutations and combinations is astronomically large it is as large as 10 to the power 30 if you were to put all kind of 
permutations and combination of ingredients given that a typical recipe has 10 ingredients in it and this number is more than the number of stars that are there in the whole universe as estimated well can we use the power of computation to come up with those which are palatable and those which are potentially tasty and hopefully those which can be healthy as well well that's the question we are asking and we are inspired by this movie ratatouille in my lab wherein chef gustav keeps saying that indeed anyone can cook so the question that we are asking is that can computers cook can the uh, tools of machine learning and artificial intelligence be utilized in a meaningful fashion to be able to come up with recipes that are creative that draw from human intelligence and a corpora of text which has been gathered from a large number of traditional recipes written recipes and thereby can be used for synthesizing new recipes that's a question we are asking and we have gone ahead and published research articles in respected conferences and journals wherein we presented a framework for generating new recipes and we have named it ratatouille and this app which is available at this url allows you to go and play with ingredients choose certain ingredients and try to generate a recipe which potentially would look like a novel recipe so you can actually choose ingredients of your choice and come up with a new recipe altogether such as this one which can be now experimented which can be used for challenging the intuition of a chef to come up with a new recipe or help him or her to generate a new recipe altogether of different type of regional cuisines following the patterns in indian cuisine or a french or a italian or a brazilian cuisine for that matter so this is a recipe which has been ab initio generated by a natural language processing driven artificial intelligence protocol that is published now in icd we are of course moving on in different directions beyond recipes which involves looking at the flavor percepts of ingredients using data coming from flavor db and similar databases that we have constructed and we want to ask this question is it possible by looking at the molecular descriptors to predict the taste of a molecule a single molecule itself can be having a certain taste a distinct taste such as sweet salty sweet uh, bitter uh, umami and similar so is it possible for us to predict the taste of a molecule is the question that we are asking and this is important because we would like to go ahead and identify molecules which are having a desirable taste or a desirable taste and odor profile and for that we have used machine learning protocols and have uh, created this tool called bittersweet published in scientific reports wherein we can look at a molecule a new molecule any given molecule identify its molecular fingerprints certain descriptors which can be computed with the help of a machine and apply simple regression techniques to uh, uh, not regression in this case it is uh, a classification techniques to identify and uh, whether a molecule is more of a sweet or a bitter and this is what is called bitter sweet and can be used by even a lay user where you can draw a molecule you can upload a molecule and check whether the molecule is more of a bitter or a sweet of course we are trying to expand this research direction in trying to predict the taste in other dimensions such as salty sour and umami towards the end i would like to present you about the health aspect of food and how computational gastronomy is making strides in trying to provide interesting insights into the nutrition and the health aspect of recipes and food ingredients we tend to come across all kind of contradictory assertions about how a certain food is good for you as well as maybe it is good bad for you as well such as that of egg fat or tomato or ginger for that matter and i believe this is happening so because food itself is a complex entity and its interaction with human body body mechanisms give rise to complex consequences 
which are not so easy to predict and therefore cannot be put into a simple equation such as the one which is portrayed in front of you thereby making it very difficult to come up with dietary intervention strategies and that is where i guess ashok was also mentioning that do not believe any dietary intervention which gives you a generic advice of something being good or bad in general it may depend on you your body type and even the dosage that you would like to take all of these are extremely sensitive factors so one of the early attempts that we did was to look at the data published data of ingredients to start with we looked at herbs and spices because they were critical for indian recipes not only india but many other recipes coming from oriental cultures and therefore we said let us figure out what might be critical when it comes to herbs and spices when it uh, is there any uh, role that they are playing when it comes to health and that is where we dug out literature from pubmed and uh, medline and identified research articles which mention a herb or a spice as well as the name of a disease and an association between the two which can be now identified using a text mining protocol and we went ahead and figured out the positive negative associations and built this data resource called spicerx which is freely available for explorations for academic purposes and we concluded by the end of it by this analysis that indeed going beyond the flavor and aroma that herbs and spices tend to contribute towards the recipes and the antimicrobial properties for which they are known for a while now they tend to have a large spectrum of benevolent effects across the body uh, uh, mechanisms such as the gastro gastrointestinal mechanisms neurological mechanisms etc and that is what is published in this plus one paper way back in 2018 we we showed that indeed based on the literature herbs and spices are potentially used not uh, primarily because of their broad spectrum benevolent effect beyond their taste and aroma which obviously is critically important from a hedonic perspective going forward we have also built a data repository called dietrx which looks at a large number of food ingredients such as tomatoes chilies ginger onion and think of it there are 2200 food ingredients that is, that are present in our data repository and their disease associations and this food disease associations data is rather unique to our dietrx data resource which has been further integrated with ex external data sets of chemicals which are present in food as well as the gene related association gene chemical and gene disease associations which have been integrated seamlessly to provide a search interface where you can look for food their disease associations as well as chemicals in food which might be re, uh, known to be the reasons for their benevolent or harmful effects for that matter all of these data resources and computational strategies algorithms that we are building we believe is contributing towards a new revolution which can bring about personalized nutrition which can make it possibility and one of the research that has been published in this direction way back in 2015 is coming from Weizmann Institute of Israel wherein they looked at how different factors body factors that can be measured including gut microbiomes the blood re, blood related parameters as well as body mass body mass index all of this can be quantified in addition to a recipe a food that you are consuming on a daily basis and can be associated with health and they looked at a specific body parameter in this case it was nothing but post meal increase in glucose the post prandial glucose level and they could come up with a machine learning algorithm which is depicted here as a personalized nutrition predictor to tell you whether eating certain kind of a recipe standardized diet standardized recipe is it going to be good for you or bad for you in terms of increasing or decreasing the postprandial glucose level which has got a strong correlation tight association with type 2 diabetes 
so i believe that there is a huge potential for conducting similar kind of studies in different cultural contexts in different cuisine contexts to identify recipes that may be used consumed or not consumed by individuals which might help in help uh, in towards maintaining uh, their health in the context of type 2 diabetes obesity and for that matter cardiovascular disorders which are heavily intertwined with diet towards the end i would like to summarize to tell you that this research in computational gastronomy is very early which is we, we are our lab is the pioneering lab in trying to put together food data and computational techniques by virtue of which we would like to bring upon the data driven food innovations and this blend of food and artificial intelligence is helping us come up with new innovations in the context of food so as to bring up innovations in design of food and beverages coming up with novel food beverages pairing which could be liked by uh, different uh, populations of humans coming up with prediction of taste and odor of small molecules which can be used for identification of molecules which are let's say sweet but not adding to the calorific profile of uh, your food finding culinary fingerprints of different cuisines and coming up with dietary interventions not to mention probably this will take us towards a direction where we can come up with food innovations which are going to uh, going to be sustainable given the fact that we are moving in a towards a world which needs sustainable innovations i believe that we should be able to come up with local and seasonal foods ingredients and ingredient combinations giving rise to possibly potentially new recipes that are tasty and healthy as well so the adventure that we have been doing in my lab for the last 7 years and is ongoing in my lab of computational gastronomy we i'm trying to write it up in a, a popular science book which is accessible to any lay audience in the name bite tentatively called bite the digital science of food wherein we would like to tell you about the basics of the sci scientific basis of food ingredients recipes cuisines evolution of cuisines bit of historical facts and how all of these data driven science around food can help us moving towards a new science of food which is extremely computer science driven and can make use of new tools of 21st century such as machine learning and artificial intelligence so having given you premise that i give up somebody as uh, someone who wanted to be an astronomer did my project in ayuka inter university center for astronomy and astrophysics in pune and always wanted to discover new dishes i take solace in this quote coming from none other than brilla savarin the author of the book physiology of taste and someone who coined the term gastronomy in the first place while it has taken more than 150 years for us to move from gastronomy to computational gastronomy it seems as if what he said long back still rings true the discovery of a new dish confers more happiness on humanity than the discovery of a new star so hopefully we i believe along with a lot of other people who are trying to contribute in this direction we should be able to discover new recipes new dishes which will make humanity not only happier but also healthier possibly so thank you for listening to me patiently and i am open for any questions that you may have now thank you thank you professor bagle uh, you really blended the food with computer so i hope uh, the audience are agreed with my sent i mean the statement so we can take few questions uh, Uh, thank you, Professor Ganesh Bagler. Uh, it was this is uh, Professor Vinayak Sathe. Uh, it is a wonderful dish you have given this uh, competition gastronomy before our lunch. Uh, I'm very glad to be here and uh, attend this your session. Uh, my I have um, got some few ideas how the food or thinking about the food can influence people. There are people who are using ASMR kind of. treatment for certain kind of people having the cravings and they don't, cannot stop the craving like they're constantly eating so uh, this computational gastronomy can 
take the further other uh, areas that uh, not only the food use as a medicine for the physical but the mental illnesses so many mental illnesses so uh, my question is that um, in this like we say um, food comes before health and before food the agriculture you know, comes have you have done any research in the space of that where growing fruits in natural way uh, can impact the health and happiness of the people thank you well thanks a lot professor sati for asking that question and bringing about that dimension of uh, farm to fruit fork as it is called while we are looking at the cultural aspect by virtue of looking at recipes traditional recipes and of course the scientific uh, and hedonic aspect by looking at the flavor composition of the recipes and uh, the uh, the ingredients uh, that go into the recipes quite clearly the food system which starts all the way from uh, agriculture is extremely important yes only now we have been uh, recently been funded by welcome trust uh, it's a it's an inter institutional grant that has been offered to us where we'll be looking at uh, food practices in certain tribal regions of india trying to come up with ways by which one can learn from the traditional knowledge that we have traditional practices that have been present and come up with mechanisms which can revolutionize agricultural practices starting from farm all the way up to the fork that is the recipe we are trying to do that although there is no take home message at the moment since the project has just begun but we are exploring that dimension as well good afternoon sir uh, i am kunta um uh, now yes food is one side the pleasure and the creativity but in today's world the other side is the necessity and unavailability so in the wake of uh, we've been doing some work um with with uh, climate change and the food security part and we have found that there are 28 ways of eating taro whereas the primary region which is solomon island which would have to depend upon taro in case of uh, their agricultural land loss only know three so mapping of the traditional knowledge as you as you said growing eating as well as the uh, nutritional value yes we've been trying to do it with a uh, nail and a hammer not with ai but i would like to really know your perspective how we could map the local cuisine as sustainable cuisine um, the crop as well as of uh, the global culinary knowledge that we have to produce uh, perhaps the required amount of nutrition for uh, a a kind of disturbed regions which could be political as our neighbor a little far away because of a war or because of climate change in many other places if you can reflect on that so thank you thank so, you very much yeah yeah thanks for asking that question uh, so climate change and sustainability is one of the most uh, important factors uh, especially when you keep a long term vision of food uh, food space uh, across the globe very important i must say so i believe that there is a lot of scope for bringing to the together the traditional knowledge the example uh, that you gave of what are the different ways by a certain ingredient can be processed nutrition can be maintained and a recipe can be designed which is palatable apart from being nutritional and healthy if it is uh, if it is going to be palatable or not so the kind of data resources that we have built whether it is recipe db or for that matter flavor db help us moving in that direction of innovation by which you can use uh, different uh, processing on ingredients uh, just to give an illustration we have more than 20000 ingredients which are used in 116000 recipes that are compiled in our structured repository and there are close to 300 different cooking processes such as boiling frying sauteing roasting etc which go into processing these ingredients so there may be some novel ways of processing existing ingredients which have not been uh, explored traditionally speaking but there may be enough scope for doing it for creating new recipes which are palatable tasty and hopefully maintain their nutrition so 
i believe there is a huge uh, you know uh, scope for uh, taking this work in the direction of data analytics and just to add to uh, what you said i would like to touch upon one more thing for example the carbon footprint of the recipes is one of the important direction when it comes to sustainability and we have recently done this research and published a paper on it where we look at all the recipes their ingredients and the carbon footprint of these ingredients and the quantities with which they are used thereby to uh, come up with a mechanism by which we can estimate a typical carbon and water footprint of a, a different type of recipes thereby providing ways by which we can identify recipes that are far more sustainable and which can be propagated uh, for more uh, more use uh, by the population i hope that answers your question thanks thanks sir i am varsha uh, first of all i would like to say very thank you for presenting this one the wonderful slides were there each slide was uh, talking the more with less words so meanwhile in your slides i found somewhere the function f and in the bracket you are putting the uh, uh, the cube of vegetables and all and uh, tensor product with person which is equal to the symbol of uh, like going towards doctor i didn't got it really can you explore it more like uh, whether it like always we will go to that or somewhere else will happen i want to know from you okay thank you thank you for thank asking you. that question so very briefly let me elaborate on that well it is nothing but the fact that food itself can be seen as a complex package made up of uh, you know not only the flavors which entice our uh, bodily mechanisms the olfactory and gustatory mechanisms but also provide us nutrition via the micro and macro nutrients that is what is represented by the food cube that i that is shown to you which includes not only uh, uh, plant, uh, vegetables but also fruits meat and other animal products and on the other side was shown the human body human body itself is pretty complex in terms of how it processes different food ingredients thereby giving rise to health consequences the stethoscope which was shown on the extreme right is indicator of health consequences not only of Uh, the fact that we go to the doctor it only says that look this is what leads to certain good and certain not so good health related consequences that is what that picture tries to depict and the take home message that i wanted to provide there was that such a simplistic mathematical representation of food human body association with health is not easily accessible to us and that is where i believe data driven investigations such as the one which we are doing in our lab can be helpful in coming up with interesting ways by which we can play with ingredients to identify recipes that could be potentially healthy finish last question from me hopefully last uh, my question is that uh, how do you account for those local varieties of food grown i mean uh, food grown in different localities and they taste different okay so obviously their molecular contents will be different so does your uh, database account for all that variations in uh, item the question stems from if you remember lalji's description of radish from jonpur versus <laughs> hyderabad to delhi right <laughs> right right so uh, thanks uh, shashi for raising that question uh, well let me tell you this that computational gastronomy is uh, today where physics was in 18th century very early stages of quantification and uh, bringing together computational and mathematical models which can help us interesting uh, answer help us answer interesting questions so uh, to put it straight Uh, at the moment our data of flavors as well as ingredient uh, labeling doesn't account for a large variety of ingredients that are present uh, uh, you know that are used traditionally speaking so for example the tomato we have only one flavor profile for the tomato similarly for the uh, potato and uh, uh, chili but at the same time uh, for some of the ingredients the popular ingredients such as chicken and beef we may have ingredient profile available for different processed 
don't forget that apart from their geographical origins even the processing may change their uh, flavor profile which it does and therefore we need to identify the flavor profiles even for uh, different processed ingredients as well so yes as of now this rich uh, detail is not present in flavor db but yes we are we have created uh, you know an ontology of food ingredients including those local variations for which we are trying to gather both the flavor profiles as well as nutritional profiles which are so far not available but we are trying to gather it through certain collaborations done with private companies and hopefully even government indulges in similar experiment given the fact that food and nutrition is an important factor but yes that's a blind spot at the moment shashi to answer your question briefly Uh, good afternoon sir uh, so as we discovered the association between uh, diseases and uh, different food ingredients uh, and based on the diseases a particular person is suffering from uh, we will be giving different uh, food recommendations to that person so i think uh, there is a uh, uh, we should consider uh, age groups or uh, genders also because uh, calorie requirements or uh, nutrient requirements for different age groups are different and uh, the same is the case for gender also so as we are considering this is factor by uh, giving personal recommendations so we can ha- uh, we can consider uh, different age groups and uh, uh, genders also by recommending uh, a selection of uh, ingredients and uh, those things that yeah. was just my thank point. you yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you thanks yeah thanks for making that point the point is well taken may i say that going beyond the fact is yes indeed we need to look at a variety of other factors such as gender age uh, for that matter even personal uh, composition individual composition can be very very different uh, you know from person to person and that is where i projected the personalized nutrition paradigm uh, for which some of the early experiments have been already done and some very interesting experiments and uh, uh, projects are ongoing so i believe that uh, well beyond gender and well beyond age group food can be extremely personal and by designing similar machine learning uh, algorithms such as the one which has been devised by wiseman institution we should be able to come up with personalized nutrition nutrition which is or the kind of recipes the kind of food which is good for you vis-a-vis what is good for me that could be very very different so i should be able to advise what should be consumed by you versus what should be consumed by me given my personal constitution and the kind of diseases that i may be uh, pre maybe uh, predisposed for compared to what you are so personalized nutrition is a better way and is a far uh, far uh, is evidently doable uh, given that uh, uh, experiment that was done by wiseman institution that is where the food space is moving towards So yeah, uh, Professor Bagler, we have one question from online audience. Uh, I believe you can uh, take it. Right? So I don't know. It's a question or the comment. Yeah, it's But it's available. Let me let me read this. Shall I read uh, for you? Yeah, I I got the question. I believe it's available to the audiences as well. Yeah, so it it's about uh, you know uh, can we have personalized nutrition's a dish in a digital restaurant or a illness relevant factor using a dynamic machine learning model yes uh, trust me there are uh, experiments which are being done there are new tools including android apps which are being developed which will gather personalized data in a dynamic fashion using for example uh, a glycometer which is uh, you know which is uh, uh, connected to you and some other body parameters which can be measured and depending on that a food a recipe can be advised to you uh, not only to cater to your health but also to cater to your taste preferences so people are working on it data is being gathered and you will have an app similar to zomato and swiggy uh, you might have an app which will direct you to the nearest restaurant or a typical recipe which can be made and personalized to you specifically of course it is going to take some time before we can reach to such a solution but it is already uh, being proposed and startups are coming in that direction 
Yeah, wonderful. So uh, I'm still skeptical that we should conclude this webinar or not, but again, we are hungry. So let me take the chance to invite uh, Dr. Surbhi Swanam for the vote of thanks and concluding remarks. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bagler, for your interesting talk. However, I will begin thanking from the first uh, uh, speaker as well. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, having this, uh, this event all together. And uh, a special thanks to the, the speakers, Mr. Krish Ashok, who spoke on the science of modern Indian cooking. He uh, also told us about the thermodynamics and biochemistry of cooking, especially on the gastrophysics part of it. And interestingly, he both broke many myths of cooking that we have been practicing on and off without knowing about these problems. Also, thanks to Professor Fuller for his uh, interesting talk on the prehistoric cooking practices, as especially about the pots and the ovens across the Eurasian area and also for telling us about the food practices including the grains and the alcohol beverages that have been practiced across the prehistoric times especially specifically in the indian continent also thanks to professor uh, ganesh bagler again for introducing us to the uh, computability of food with the data driven approach and is, is with a special perspective on the indian food and its diversity and also to tell, tell us how we can use computers to reinvent the entire cuisine of India and look into different kind of, of, uh, of cuisine, which has been being uh, practiced traditionally and how it can lead us to the modern cuisine of India. At the end, I would like to thank Professor Prabhat Ranjan for guiding us to, through this, uh, to organize this entire event. And also uh, a special thanks to Dr. Sanjay Kumar and Professor Shashi Singh for organizing and making this happen for us. Uh, although we have been thinking about it for some time, but thank you very much for making this happen. Uh, in the last, I would like to thank Mr. Amit Kumar Om and the entire technical team for the seamless transmission of the webinar. I understand that in the, these times we should be more used to it, but technical difficulties are almost unavoidable. Thankfully, it did not happen this time. Thanks. Thanks again to the audience uh, for your uh, immense uh, uh, patience and uh, your attention through this uh, through this event, and also for the interesting questions which kept the entire event alive and very interesting in terms of uh, the exchange of knowledge that we had. Thank you very much and uh, a very good afternoon and maybe good morning to, to Professor Fuller <laughs> and uh, have a good day. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thanks.